We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Mantry and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered for episode 901 this week. And uh, no one will know this listening to it, but behind the scenes, it's a different day. It's a different time. Tom's exceedingly tired as we're doing this. Uh, I'm pretty discombobulated. Topic list got done literally seconds before we came online here. So uh, yeah, this this could be... As Tom said, short or very punctual, probably the first one. We have some topics that we could easily discuss at length, but I guess we'll try to keep them short when we get to them. Or we'll just push stuff to next week like we always do. It's That's fun. a possibility. I think they're things, far things enough will be up in the topic list that uh, that will hit them because we do our whole first in, first out system here. So why are we recording the night before yes. that we normally record? Because Tuesdays apparently is the only day anybody can do anything... <laughs> Ever. Well, including us, you know. <laughs> well, no. We were first. I've been doing we Tuesday first. afternoon recordings yes. for years now. That like is literal y- years. Quite well established at this point. I've been pretty consistent yet, about my days off and when I'm available to record. Last Tom. week we had the guy finishing up the wall or whatever. We did indeed. And then, uh, the, the, and then they, they came in. He may have came in right after the right after we recorded the podcast or the okay. day the next day and said, "Okay, so we're going to finish up. We're going to finish up this week. We're going to have it done by Monday mm-hmm. and Tuesday. They can come in and do the carpets. They're going to be here all day on Tuesday." I'm like, "Right." It's like unless you want me to push them to a different day. I'm like, "No." At this nope. point, I no. I would like to have. Uh, I would like to have it done as soon as possible. It's like when the doctor but calls seriously, and says they have a, a slot available for you. You go on the yes. doctor's schedule, not on yours. Right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I have to push everything aside and okay. do this instead. So it is fine. It is fine. I am irritated, but no one cares. We will make do. <laughs> <laughs> Just so uh, you know why Tom might be extra cranky and ranty on this week's episode. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. No one's listening for me anymore, Rob. They used to listen for me back in the day. That was I, I wouldn't was say expert. that's true. You you almost <laughs> always get the credit true. for all the recommendations and that. So people are, <laughs> people it's it's that it's that bassy tone in your voice. It it, it speaks uh, with authority. When Tom recommends a product, that. it makes sense. Tom very rarely recommends. That's not true. By the way, those headphones, they're down to 92 finally. Yeah, the the, the sound peats uh space I've been whatever. Using them exclusively. My wife's mad at me. She's like, "Are you put those headphones on again?" I'm like, "I'm trying to get them under 90." Right. I just want to get them under 90 because it still says like in the settings, yep. like when you look at your Bluetooth, yep. it still says they're charged to 100%. Oh, like I want to see if at 90 it, at 89 it'll <laughs> pop it down to 90 percent or whatever but just to be clear in the you, app you have not charged them since you first talked about them on this podcast i charged them i'll be honest with you ah. i got the headphones quite a while ago okay i charged them when i first got when you first them, got them and then left them for like a and they have not been plugged into power since not at all <laughs> And they're Bluetooth, so it's not like they're, ludicrous. They're, they're not plugging into your phone and drawing a charge from that or something. Nope. Ah. They are just wireless. They're just wireless, and they're just sitting there like there's the box they came in is sitting next to my my computer. Yep. I just keep throwing them back in that box. <laughs> Unless there's some sort of secret charger in there, <laughs> some inductive charging. Because believe me, I I was like right. looking for it. Yeah. And they they are still. Ninety two percent. Like I can I listen to them all freaking day yesterday that is wild. to get them from 95 to 92 yeah 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 like like i got up at like nine and put them on and then had them on and on on and off all day long yeah. all day long while i was working because yesterday i was not very productive but <laughs> i just kept at it and uh uh stupid stupid things i'm just like keep watching i'm like please can you please and i i have expressed to tom my suspicion that the battery scale only goes from 90 to 100 and that <laughs> it might it, that it actually indicates he's at uh, like you know 20 percent right now when it says 92 that said even if 
that turns out <laughs> that to be the case. case. It's a still excellent battery life regardless. So <laughs> Was it two weeks ago? Yeah, two weeks ago, two we weeks ago, we talked about them on this podcast. We talked about them on yes. the podcast, yeah. <laughs> two weeks ago, we talked about them on the podcast. I have been using them exclusively yes. at home. Like, I have like, not been using them At least an my, hour or anyway. two every day and quite often yes. much more than that. Yes. Yeah. And they just won't So, yeah, even, even if they die when it reaches 90% instead of their actually still being 90% of the battery left, which would be very ridiculous. It's going to take you a year to drain them, apparently, if that's true. Well, 120 true. something hours is what they're rated at without right. the ANC. I'm not using ANC. So they're rated at 123 hours. I'm like, it's going to take me months yes. to get rid of these it's things. It's a full half, be... half a year at the rate that you're using them. The rate be. that I'm going? Yeah. It's stupid. Well, there you go. All right, Rob, what did you watch? Yes, uh, so I watched uh, over this past week a couple of movies, neither of which I particularly liked uh, that much. The first one, I don't recognize this name. I don't, I don't Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know what? I'm going to talk about Madam Web first. Okay. And everybody says Madam Web, even though there's an E on the end of Madam, which suggests it's Madame, but everybody says Madam Web, so that's what I'm going to say too. Um, now, this has been like pilloried online uh people were i would say with justification uh yeah. belly laughing at the trailers because the trailer for this movie was god awful I, I, I have not seen the, the trailer i've seen like it start and then i've scrolled away from it yes and, and it's yeah. uh had several memes and stuff that people have enjoyed and the very famous line that was taken from the trailer that everybody was making fun of doesn't actually get said in the movie like she says all of those words at very different times throughout the movie right. and it was all hacked and edited together for the trailer and sounded that, that, awful in the trailer people were making that fun tracks. of that so madam webb was not nearly as bad as almost all of the reviews that I have read about it. It was not that terrible, which is kind of to the movie's detriment, because if it were as terrible as all of the online reviews are saying, it would have been a lot more fun to watch. Uh, the one word I would use to describe not this... Not so good, it's... Not so bad, it's good. Not to me, Level. anyway. The word I would use to describe this movie is bland. Um, mm. You know, which is not a great... <laughs> a great uh, ringing Another endorsement great for a for a superhero spider well i'm glad you mentioned that because uh i don't really think too many people are going to be upset if i give some light spoilers for this movie uh there has never been a superhero movie with a greater lack of superheroes, of superheroes? than madam webb <laughs> so the character of madam webb in the comics because i have been watching uh, i just watched so comics Oh crap! I, mean, I can't remember the guy's. His name is Rob. Uh, that's yeah. Comics explained. I think is just yeah, his comics channel. explained. I, so. I just watched him his whole like nine hour video <laughs> about Spider Man. Like the, the like he the, does the, like to dig in. He does a great job. Well, it, it was it was like multiple videos all strung together, mm -hmm. right? That were all that 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 did this one whole run. Yeah, you know, with the venom and all stuff. Anyways, so I watched the whole thing, and Madame Web does show up in there. Sure, and she's like, like what kind? Like why? Who would looked at that and went, you know what? Let's make that character. Well, that's just because she's she's like in a wheelchair with, and she's blind. Yes, in the comics. Yeah, and all she does is come in there and say, "Hey." There's this big bad guy you guys should go she, get. She's clairvoyant. Because she's clairvoyant. She can see yes. the future. And then sometimes she's like, oh, I need you guys to come help me get this big bad guy that, yeah. that's out there that I've foreseen. Yes. And she's more of a Professor X-ish sort of thing. I mean, she's a bit more Watchtower type of yes. type of yes, character. Yes, Watchtower. There you um, go. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, Madam Web in the comics does not have her own dedicated comic book. Um, no. She, she doesn't have a title series. Uh, so, yeah, people were kind of like, okay, interesting character to go with. But, I mean, you know, look, you take any character, adapt them really well to their own movie, and we're, we're all for it. And I'm usually, like, for them doing characters that aren't big right you know what i mean like the same thing i mean i always use guardians of the galaxy as yeah you have a bit more latitude like, right if you take some well, liberties the, not too many people are going to be upset well and the people that are going to be upset are like the diehard fans that knew guardians of the galaxy yes. existed beforehand and you know they're always going to be upset anyway so don't worry about those so guys. madam webb the movie is very much an origin story uh we okay. find out how she ended up blinded and in the wheelchair um oh 
I did not know that. Yes. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, that, that, uh, that, that's fine. I usually, usually origin stories are my favorite part of comic book sure. movie series. That tends to be what I enjoy the most. Uh, and it is a period piece. Now, where it's 2003, uh, so recent history, but still a period piece nonetheless. It is set in the past. Um, and all of the Fire. scuttlebutt of people in the know of who have, you know, seen earlier drafts of the script and that um, was that this was very much supposed to be tied to the Parker family and Peter Parker. Ah. And there are still some of the characters present in the movie, uh, but apparently, you know, their Sony's agreement with uh, Marvel Studios required that they not actually include Peter Parker in this movie, so that Fair name enough. never gets said, and they can only hint at him and all these, I mean, he, a baby at the time. Uh, so all these types of things, and it became rather awkward in terms of the rather obvious having to cut around things that used to be in the script and are no longer allowed to be said due to contractual right. obligations. Uh, but getting back to the whole complete lack of superheroes in this, if you've seen the trailers and you've seen the fleeting glimpses of the three spider women characters in their costumes, you have seen the entirety of the superheroes <laughs> in that movie. I had heard movie. that. I had heard that. Yeah. <laughs> it is um, that. Uh, the very uh, uh, justified criticism that I have read um, was that this movie in its writing, at least in the final version of it that we end up seeing on screen is probably not what was intended in the original drafts of this thing but what ends up being up there on screen it breaks the covenant between storyteller and listener um it, it breaks the rules of storytelling in a way that, like, if you were Stanley Kubrick, maybe you could get away with it. This movie definitely cannot. Um, they have not one, but two clairvoyant characters have these flashing glimpses of the three Spider Women characters in costume. We get that early on from not one, but two clairvoyant characters. And then we never get to them being in costume. Now that that breaks the rule of three. That breaks every law of foreshadowing oh. in the writing world. It's somewhat unforgivable in storytelling terms. And like I say, if you are an absolute auteur who gets to the level of being able to break the rules because you are so brilliant at everything else right. you do with your storytelling that this movie absolutely does not get there. The villain, uh, I, I feel so bad for the actor. Uh, English is not his native language, but the words he is given to say are horrible. <laughs> and it is a completely terrible villain i mean the, the absolute most i have heard that as well <laughs> absolute most cookie cutter nonsensical his motivations make no sense at all uh but you know other than to just make him a villain for no good reason um and then dakota johnson i like her i i like her in almost everything i see i find her enjoyable as a mm. performer um she, she she's just someone that i like uh to watch. I don't know that, well, I, that I've seen her in anything. I mean, I'm she's sure most I famous have. from the Fifty Shades of Grey movies. That's, that's didn't see it. got, uh, but I, I actually liked her when she was on TV the most. I thought that was the most fun acting she did. I'm forgetting the name of the series she was in. Uh, but uh, yeah. It feels like a Grey's Anatomy sort of thing. No, no, no. It was, a, it was a comedy series. But I, uh, anyway, she is like half asleep through this whole movie. Uh, she has one level to everything she says, no matter how life-threatening the situation might be she has the exact same monotone delivery through the entire movie uh yeah really seemed like she had no energy to be there and sydney sweeney uh who is like very much a star on the rise these days yes. what a waste of Sydney Sweeney in this movie. It is such a shame. I am just glad that we are already used to seeing actors portraying more than one comic book character in different movies. Yeah. We as an audience can definitely handle that. Sydney Sweeney is someone who should probably be a superhero in some franchise mm. and could carry a franchise on her own. She has that kind of star power. So um, yeah, if she shows up as another Marvel or DC character, I will have no problem with that. Uh, also, they made her look kind of different from the way she normally looks in this movie anyway, so it really wouldn't be a problem. Enough about Madam Web. It don't spend $25 to buy a high-end movie ticket and go see it. You can put it on in the background while it's streaming. I will say that it has been revealed that the same people who wrote 
Mobius. Morbius. Wrote, yeah. Morbius. Yes. Whatever. Wrote Madame Web. And that I, track. To, to, well, <laughs> I did not make it very far into Mo- Morbius. I'll be okay. honest with you. I, I did start Which again, that movie. Which like, wasn't it, bad enough to be so yeah. bad that it's enjoyable. Yeah. You've got to do one so, or the other. And, and, and again, I am an apologist for all these people. Yes, I really am because there are so many moving parts to a movie that I, I, I don't think that you can just point your finger at one person and say, you ruined it. Okay? Oh, no. I mean, the, the, but, Madam Web is packed full of talented people. Yeah. Packed full. Of- uh, so to see the same two, right, two, two of the writers that did Morbius and, and also Madam Web and go, why would you let these people write more movies? The, the question you have to ask is, how did they end up? In that situation. I mean, I bet their original you know. drafts were impressive. <laughs> I'm well, willing to I'm willing to put a wager on that. And at some point you have to you have to tell you have to, you have to ask yourself, because there isn't a couple other screenwriting credits on there, and one of mm-hmm. the screenwriting credits is from somebody who like doesn't exist or maybe is dead <laughs> or something. So clearly people had their name on it and they went, like, yeah. oh, I don't want to be associated with this and yeah. took their name off of it. They're like, hey. Any credit's a good credit. I don't really care. You know what I mean? I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave my as, name on this. They can turn in a script on time, and they can hey. and they can make the changes that the studio demands of them. Demands of them very so, clearly. I mean, <laughs> it's not like I would love to just be able to point at one person and blame them for everything that's no, wrong no, with it a work single like movie, that. but it does not work like that. So yes, Madam Web. It's unfortunate because I. As as much as I love to slam Sony and and all the non Marvel properties that they have absolutely screwed up, mm-hmm. like just Fantastic Four, and all that other stuff that's <laughs> just atrocious. You, the old ones. I, I really about don't want we, them. I don't yeah. want the next movie that that's coming out. Like every time a movie comes out, I'm like, ooh, that looks kind of neat. Mm. I'm going to see that. That looks kind of neat. I'm a, I'm kind of a fanboy for all of it. Yep, I am. I'm a fanboy for Get all of it. Get ready for Craven the Hunter. It's next. <laughs> Oh God! Part of, part of this How could they Spider-Man sp- spin-off series. That, I'll be honest with you. I think it takes talent to make Craven good. Right. I, I I remember reading the Spider-Man comics when Craven was. I don't know that he was introduced at that point. He had been around, but the big story that Craven became famous through Spider-Man. Like I remember reading those was comics hunting was, Spider-Man, it, which he's not allowed to do in the Sony movies. So this is going to be a great start, right? <laughs> so he's he's hunting Spider-Man. It's this really like really good story that right. was written, yeah. and the whole time I'm like, this is the dorkiest looking character it's I have. Like, also I can't, probably I'm the story that was guy. originally going to be adapted in the original draft of the Craven the Hunter movie, and then Marvel came along and said, nope, you can't have Peter Parker in your Craven movie either. Yeah. So, yeah, that's going to be a disaster. Anyway, I watched another movie uh, that I also personally uh, didn't think that highly of, didn't hate it, uh, and my goodness, there is, again, a ton of talent packed into this mm. movie, which is Titan. Uh, it's a French language movie. I did look it up. It's like a body horror thing. Well, yeah, that's the genre it's described as. I'll, I'll get into my criticism of it a little bit here. It had like rave reviews out of, uh, I forget which film fun, uh, uh, uh Can It was in Can. Yeah. Uh, so rave reviews out of there. Uh, one I, it might have won the Palme d'Or award, uh, won one of the big awards at that film festival anyway, uh, basically proclaiming that this director is like the second or I guess third coming of Cronenberg since there's already the original Cronenberg and his son doing this body horror type of thing. But this, like, it isn't a horror movie at all. It's it's not scary whatsoever. It is art house. It does have surrealism in it for sure. But... I th- so on the one hand, what was clever about this movie when you're taking it to a critics association uh, for, for viewing in that is that they basically threw in references to so many um, like triggering types of topics that anybody who has a dog in any of those political or sociological fights is yeah. going to glob onto one scene and herald it as look at how they included this in their movie <laughs> which is exactly the types of reviews that I saw uh the reviews that I read that were like glowing praise of this movie had nothing to do with the movie 
they, they had a uh, topic that they wanted to stand on a soapbox about, about, and Titan gave them or a scene or two to prompt mm-hmm. the speech that these people wanted to give in their review. So I guess applause for that, because they knew the audience that they were making this movie for. Uh, but the lead actress, uh, Agathy Roussel, um, she is very tall, um, uh, um, a model, so she has those very sharp-looking features in that. Right. Um, very capable of looking androgynous, which is key to this movie. And believable as physically imposing. Uh, for this movie to work, you have to believe that she could physically overpower a man. And I did believe it. She she is tall enough and statuesque enough and built enough and and carries herself with a uh, a cadence uh in a way that i i believe like yeah she could actually physically overpower someone and that worked she is also completely unafraid to be made to look ugly to be uh in very compromising situations this is a french made film People are naked all the time uh, and and not good <laughs> looking naked. Like you're going to be yeah, in yeah. horrible posture in horrible, ugly situations, all dirtied up, your hair all cut in weird ways. And she is completely unafraid to do any of that. She completely commits to it and goes for it. And I have a ton of praise for that. Vincent Linden, who is the, the main uh, co-lead in this, um, his performance is really Powerful, like it, it worked for me. His performance worked for me very much. Um, believing that he is a man unable to properly grieve over his son because his son was either kidnapped or or vanished in some way, and don't actually know if his son is dead, and so he's mm. stuck in this purgatory. He's been stuck there for over a decade, not knowing what really happened to his son, and the performance that he gives is is excellent and. Also completely believable that uh, a man, like he's actually the captain of the uh, fire brigade uh, in his town, and he's he's getting older now, and he's trying to keep up physically with all the young guys in his crew, and so he is I- injecting steroids and that, and it's like all of that plays completely believably. Where this movie gets into some surrealism is we see her character when she's very young, and she is like physically attracted to cars, uh, which is a you know, thing that some people are, um, that, yeah. I feel like I know a lot of guys like that, but maybe, <laughs> sure, yes. maybe that's not what you're talking about. <laughs> and, um, and so <laughs> they, they, they do get quite excited when the cars yes, go indeed. by. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, uh, this is very early on in the film. So she's uh, involved in a car accident. Um, she's, she's very much more like in with the cars and not so much with people and this causes tension between her and her father and then they're in a car accident she ends up with a titanium plate in her head which is where the the name of the movie comes Uh, from okay and after that it's like exaggerated even more so she's only drawn to mechanical things and really shies away from people um you know, even, she was already sort of that way to begin with, but after the accident, does it goes even more. Totally so. sound like something that would do well at can. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, and so there, have... there is a moment in the movie where, in traditional storytelling of this kind, uh, it, it gives the audience the opportunity to interpret it as the the identifiable moment of a psychological break. Uh, sure. Everything in the sound design and in the imagery that's going on in that, you're like, okay, either we're going to buy into what we see from now on is literally happening or we're going to buy into this is only taking place in her head. Sure. Um, and then, of course, as art house movies like this do, they never fully answer that question, but they show you a bunch of things, including the very final scene in the movie, which is like, it's all shown literally, but couldn't really be real uh this mm. this blending of mechanical and biological that happens to her and you know, other people involved in the movie and that so that's where the supposed body horror and all that comes in uh you know there's a lot of uh for i guess for many people would be like sexually uncomfortable situations for sure i could see it that way it's very very homoerotic in a lot of places um welcome to the internet all you people well, who are and, uncomfortable with that stuff and that was sort of it because i was i was kind of realizing when i was reading these glowing reviews that i didn't really agree with because by the end of it i just kind of went okay you know like uh, the, yeah. the the way that this movie was told it's like there are no establishing shots this director hates establishing shots we are just going to drop you right into the scene you're going to 
going to have to catch up with where we are. It's going to be these short, snip together scenes. Things don't really make sense. You don't really know why anybody did anything. Um, you know, and yeah, my it's, wife would love that movie. And, <laughs> I mean, she doesn't watch body horror anyways, but she's definitely not going to watch something where <laughs> she has to guess what's going on. Right. She's already doing and, that. And and script wise, it's kind. Of, it, it just it just falls into the pattern of and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened and yeah. there isn't a really great emotional through line although the last half of the movie at least fits together but then ends in this weird surreal place that couldn't have actually happened so i mean i got to the end of it, i was like okay all right that happened and and like the talent was there the the acting talent especially and the willingness to commit to this movie was all there so it's not for lack of trying uh but when i was going through these reviews i mean some of them ex- expressing their shock at some of the imagery and that I, that's when i realized oh i've just seen too much like uh, I've watched anime, and like if you've watched, you right. know, if you've watched, I watched anime, anime in the nineties, so let me just tell you something about anime in the nineties. Yeah, it was uh, it was eye opening. Like you want to talk saw about a lot of stuff I was not pr- quite prepared for as a yeah. twenty something. You want to talk boy. about mechanical, biological yeah. melding and gore, and you know, uh, disturbing imagery that you might not have seen before. I'm like, oh, I've seen much worse than what yeah. Titan has to offer. But uh, that's you know made me realize like someone else who hasn't seen everything that Tom and I have seen, this could be shocking to them. I get that. So I just might not have been the perfect audience for this movie. It didn't impress or shock me nearly as much as someone who hasn't seen this type of thing before. So from that yeah. point of view, I do want yeah. I do want to give it credit because they definitely put the effort in. I just didn't think it was that great in the end. Hmm. Okay, so uh, I did have been saying that we weren't going to watch any new movies in the home theater until the home theater was done. Right. And then this weekend, I was like, you know what? Let's watch Barbie. Okay. Let's go ahead and watch Barbie. And then stereo. Actually, 3.2. Ah. But uh, uh, so we popped in Barbie. Now, yeah. the minute I popped it, the minute the movie started, I was like, something's wrong. Oh. <laughs> like, immediately knew something was wrong. Nobody. It was it watching with my son and my wife. Yeah. Uh, my 14-year-old son and my wife. And... Uh, immediately knew something was wrong but i also knew that if i stopped the movie to try to figure it out it could take a long time and that would ir- irritate sure, everybody sure, sure. and we really didn't have the time for that so what it turned out it was that the hdr to sdr conversion oh, was set too high oh dear and it, 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 everything was just washed out oh that's too bad Completely this washed is such out. a beautiful colorful movie you are not seeing it optimally that's for sure yes so it, it, they're like on the the Sony I have it has five levels, yeah. one to five. Five is the most. And really, I, I after the movie was over, I found that menu really quickly, which mm. really irritated me. <laughs> Popped it down to three. Went, oh my god, look how good. Oh, okay, <laughs> so, oh that's too bad. So, uh, so my plan is to watch it again this week. Yes, after I get this, the home theater set up, and now it'll actually look better, which I will. And attribute. it bears repeat viewing, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. So. so uh, I mean, you guys all know I've been talking about being excited about about yeah. watching the Barbie movie for a long time. I don't know that I did myself right by being so excited about it because okay. it was there was very little that was going to allow me to enjoy it as much as I really, really wanted <laughs> to. Oh no, you know. So I did like it. I thought it was would, good. It was. It's would, very heavy handed as far as with sure. the the the. I mean, I don't even, can't even call it a metaphor. It just no. is. Hey, you know it hey, is. hey, hey subtle. I will say that the, the Zack Snyder joke, <laughs> the Zack Snyder the joke Zack Snyder had joke, me yes. absolutely rolling. And my <laughs> wife and my son both looked at me and went, Why? What, 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 what is that about? I'm like, Can't not breathing right now i was well it's also dying. very effective because of what it immediately follows so it works as a wonderful release <laughs> it was just the best <laughs> so um you know great performances like tons yeah. of cameos yeah. and you know there's there's like margot robbie oh my god right what can't that woman do i know what can't she do like, I've seen her play, like, on Wolf of Wall Street, she's just kind yep. of this wallflower bimbo, half <laughs> half or fully naked person, you know. And then she's this. And just yeah. like, like, there's, there's like, how can you pl- play a character that literally has no character? Like, <laughs> does not have a character. And I'm just like, rooting for you man (laughs) that's what i mean (laughs) try try whatever movie she's in whatever character she's playing whatever that character did in this movie try to not be on her side (laughs) 
Yes. One day she's going to do the uh, Charlize Theron thing where she plays a serial right, killer. Yeah, monster. And <laughs> uh, like in that monster movie. Yeah. And she's going to be and everybody's going to be like. Come on, Margo, you can you can do better. All she <laughs> has to do is have that trademark single tear come down her <sighs> face from the Oh my gosh, crushed the me. Perfect Anyways, shot it's a, <laughs> certainly a good movie. Like I said, it is very heavy handed. I did yeah. didn't much mind that so much. I think I'll well, I think because that right now from that the I know what I'm in yeah, for. It's not it's not like they it's not like they rope a dope you about what kind of movie no. this is gonna be. It is in your face from the very beginning that this is going to be a loud movie <laughs> as far as its message. <laughs> so I liked it. I mean I liked Good. it. I don't I won't say I loved it. Uh, oh, maybe I'll like it more. I think the second maybe time. on second watch, I yeah. think I think yeah. you might enjoy it even more. What about Ryan Gosling before we we do need to move on, but just before we do, what about Ryan Gosling? Right. Uh Wow. Just I'm sorry that Shang Tsung being Shang Tsung Shang Chi being Shang-Chi. in the movie <laughs> Shang Chi being in the movie like that's all I could do was look at that dude. I okay. was like, look at him, there he he's is. the Ken you cared about. All right, that's <laughs> fair enough. Ken. He's the Ken I was C-movie. like. He was kind of the bad guy Ken at the same time right, sort yes, of thing. The rival but Ken, if nothing else. Listening to them just say the word beach over and over again Indeed, was yeah. I was just like. <laughs> What are they saying? Yeah, what, that's what are they the saying? point. <laughs> it, um, but yes, Ryan Gosling did a great job too. I mean, the two of them just sort of, and I under, based on like the behind the scenes stuff that I watched yeah. afterwards, then I got the color right. Yeah. <laughs> I started watching the, the, the extras. They were like, oh, the, imp- the improvisation they were doing. I'm like, mm. oh my God, you let those two improvise? Right. <laughs> and I've seen Ryan uh, Gosling in a bunch of stuff. You know, oh, uh, yeah. he was in that, dri- that driver movie, uh, the and drive. Blade Runner. <laughs> no, he wasn't in yeah. Driver. He was in Drive. It was Drive. Drive. Was yes. Whatever that one was. Yep. The one where he drove. Had the scorpion Anyways. jacket. That's that one. Yeah. And I mean, he's always struck me. I mean, and I think he's got kind of this uh, uh, this this reputation of being just kind of like flat. Well, that was it. I was boring. Bad. Yes, it, you know, for 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 several years there, Blade Runner twenty forty nine followed not that long yeah. after that. So again, and you're very always stoic playing those characters. kind of characters. Yes. Yeah, and th- this allowed him to really it sure did <laughs> it let out chew his up the scenery a little bit. <laughs> like, and that's the thing about a movie like this. And, and I think a lot of movies that that even when the movie is not necessarily the best. If everybody who's in it is like super committed and like yes. loving every minute of it, it you sure, can't help but like it like it. Sure, seemed like everybody was on board. Uh, on I that feel that cast. way about the uh, <laughs> Big Trouble in Little China. Like I watched mm. Big Trouble in Little China, and you know, I mean, in twenty twenty three terms, you know, it's got some problematic uh, right pro- parts to it. Not nearly as much as it, as many other movies during that time. So you get kind of a pass with, with that. But you just spent the whole time. Everyone is having such a good time. Like yes. they are just loving this. Mm-hmm. And and to to see like Kim Cattrall, I I was just floored by her in that movie. And and. Uh, when a movie, when the actors and stuff are just really giving it their all yeah. and just and, and are committed to the characters and committed to having and clearly having a good time while doing it, you can't help but at some like give them a little leeway. So um, I will watch it again. We will watch it again this okay. weekend, hopefully. And we and after you got your theater and you watch Barbie again, you got to watch Across the Spider Verse next. If you, I don't have it. I have to. If, buy it. if if you don't love that one, I don't know that this might be the end of AV Rant before episode one thousand. <laughs> We gotta keep teasing that because that's gonna piss some people off, and that's what we're here for, I guess. That and answering questions. That's right. AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions to get your questions answered. All you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us a question at avrant.com. Come to our website where you can find our episodes, our show notes, and our Flickr album, so you can follow along with the pictures that we'll be talking about. Mm-hmm. If there are any pictures, I didn't see any pictures in this. There's one. a I handful. Down very, There's some. I didn't scroll down too far. Uh, Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast, YouTube.com slash AV Rant, where you can see our live recording episodes, uh, including the pictures that Rob will put up That's there. That's right. If they are there. Uh, contact us directly, Rob at AVRant.com. His socials is at First Reflect. Socials are. Yep. No, is. If I'm like on. R. If I'm is. on some type of service, then I will be at First Reflect. That's how you find me. You search for that. Socials are are it's plural. 
Yeah. Oh. I so. Yeah. I don't like the way it doesn't feel right. It feels like it should be it. Handle on socials is. Yes. Single. Yeah, there you go. Single handle. Go. Single. Yeah. It felt like it is. Yep. Uh, I'm Tom at avrent.com. I'm not on social media anymore. <laughs> <laughs> not because I'm against it, but because Instagram won't let me. That's what it is. <laughs> Come Come over to Blue Sky, I guess. That's where we'll find I you. I don't really care. I know. All right. Uh, thank our listeners this week. Become the listener of the week. Support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrent.com. Click on the Buy a Cup of Coffee link. It send you to a PayPal donation site where you can leave us some money. Mm-hmm. Or you can go to patreon.com slash podcast to sign up to become a, con- a monthly contributor. Every month, Patreon takes some money from you and give most of it to us. A minimum of a dollar. That's right. Right now, we have 131 patrons uh, over at patreon.com, including Bertrand. So thank you to all of you. Yes, indeed. That is patreon.com slash podcast. If you'd like to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation, a big thanks to our 131 patrons over there. Bertrand, thank you for continuing to be one of them. He's been a patron for a long, long time, but he still enjoys uh, mentioning it every time he writes to us, and we're happy to say his name anytime he does so. That's the way That's it works right. around here. I will be taking off this hoodie eventually because it's Too warm. cold. It's cold. Oh, it's cold. It's cold in this house. Uh-huh. It's cold outside. It's just this winter has gone on a little too long for yeah. four that we're not we're not used to it. Uh, we also got if you, you can't support us financially, support us in some other ways, and we will mention it here. Some other way, and we will mention it here. A mm-hmm. uh, bunch of other bunch of people supported us by letting <laughs> us know that the podcast didn't upload correctly. That was that it. was Vince, Jonathan, Mark, Herb, Martin, Theo, Valdez. And Ilongo, and yeah, we got the memo. We've already taken care of those TPS reports. That's right. But in all seriousness, we do appreciate the heads up about the glitch in our audio-only version last week. People really wanted to hear all of episode 900, just not the, the first 30 minutes or whatever it was. <laughs> 37 minutes is where that thing cut off originally, and yeah. So, sometimes my... And this happens when I'm not looking, I think. But I have I have no the the one time that I did catch it doing it mm-hmm. is I, I we ended up having a problem with the audio. What happens is there's a slight hiccup in the in my connection yep. as I'm uploading. Yeah. But it'll pause in the upload, but then it'll continue and give me the uh, say, right. Oh yeah, we got the say entire completed, upload. yeah. Yeah. So we also got some notes of gratitude uh for keeping the podcast going through uh, whatever is happening right now. Yes, Lots of things. I guess the there Madam were... Web. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's the thing that's going to stumble us all. <laughs> yeah, there was definitely news this week. We're not going to delve into any of it. And we're not going to talk no. about any of it because that's not that kind of podcast. But we got that from Infinite Gary, who says we have to keep going after we reach episode nine nine nine, or else DJ is going to take over the internet. Seems unlikely, and I don't <laughs> even know who this DJ person is. Yeah, so right. I don't know. I mean, how, how, how could he take over the internet when I don't even know he is? <laughs> Bobby, Bertrand, Vince, Mark, Bob, and Nathan, who says he's been, Nathan's been listening since the very beginning of AV Rant. Was Dina the very first co-host? She was indeed. I mean, is that technically true? Wasn't your very, very first co-host, Clint? No. No? Okay. No. Even I was wrong no. about that. Look at that. Yeah. We may have uh, published an episode that was so. What we what I did is I did an episode for the very first episode. I did an episode because I wanted to do the podcast by myself because I didn't think I needed any of you people. <laughs> little, little did I know <laughs> that apparently, well, I am the least popular person. It, it would have podcast. been shorter than two hours every week. It, if it would had have just been, been a twenty minute you. episode. <laughs> we is in and out. Uh, I did the episode by myself, and mm. I did the same episode with Clint and the same episode with Dina. Okay. So we it, it is the same topics basically, right? Um, and the clear winner was Dina. I like, see okay. by a freaking mile. Like it wasn't even close. So I recorded them all. I put them all up someplace, mm-hmm. and then Clint and I listened to all of them. And he's like, "Yeah, the Dina for sure, like uh, a thousand okay. percent." Uh, we may have gone back and published the Clint one. We never did the mine by myself. I threw that one out. But yes, that that is. That I certainly is. Dina, don't. Dino was the first go. I certainly don't mind the reminder because I have heard that before. Now it rings a bell, but I had forgotten the order yeah. of things there. So anyway, I'll say those names one more time: Infinite Gary, Bobby, Bertrand, Vince, Mark, Bob, and Nathan. Thank you so much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. They're very much appreciated, and a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. All right, in the news, Kef is refreshing their subwoofer lineup and bringing their music integrity engine, MIE. Mm-hmm. DSP processing to more models than ever before. The new KC92, which is two grand, doesn't appear to change much much from the current KF 
92 model. Other than being offered in both a gloss black and a gloss white finish, the, pr the price remains the same. The dimensions, basically a 14-inch sealed cube and weight are the same. And the specs of, of twin 500-watt amplifiers, 1,000 watts total, and claimed minus 3 dB output from 11 hertz. Who cares? To 200 hertz are all unchanged. And I do Kept believe it. since they don't mention otherwise that that is an in-room yeah. measurement not an in anechoic room measurement in freaking corner someplace Quite in a possibly. closet yes perhaps <laughs> no offense calf no offense but you know come on yeah come on yeah at what two volume? nine inch drivers <laughs> in the sealed enclosure 11 hertz uh, i don't uh, doubt that you can that, detect movement yeah, there is no there is a yeah. sound that but minus sound. three db hmm Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Keptus mentioned that the dual opposed force canceling nine inch drivers are now a, a design that was derived from the flagship Blade speakers, mm -hmm. which I think at some point they just started saying that whether or not it was true. But I, <laughs> it might be true. It should be true. There's no I think so. Be. I don't think there's any reason for them to lie about that. The Blades have been around so for a while. Volume and crossover knobs, but no fully variable phase, just a 0 180 degree polarity switch, just like the KF92, the KC92. Provides a selection of five presets for different subwoofer placements out in the room, against a wall, in a corner, in a cabinet, or in an apartment slash small room. Yep. <laughs> what if you're in an apartment slash small room and also in a cabinet? Then you probably go with the cabinet setting. That would be my guess. There's a ground lift, lift switch, which is nice. Yeah. If you've ever not. Yes. Ground lift is nice. And both RCA and speaker wire inputs. You can optionally add KEF's wireless subwoofer kit as well with a dedicated input for the wireless receiving unit on the back. The entire series of sealed single driver subwoofers, which KEF calls their Cube series, gets an update to include KEF MIE, that whatever that thing was in musical something something. Music engine. integrity engine. Yeah. Yes. And their new largest member mm -hmm. yet, a Cube with a K, cube with a K. Uh, 15 MIE, which is $1,400, packs a 15-inch driver and a new MIE DSP control allowing for a claimed 20 hertz minus 3 dB extension. It still uses the same 300-watt amplifier as all the other cube subwoofers. Mm -hmm. Really? We're yeah, and it's sealed. We're going, we're going with 300 watts sealed? 300 watts sealed, Are we? yeah. It is a 15-inch driver. That helps. <coughs> so, okay, whatever. Similar to the KC92, there are volume and not, uh, crossover knobs, but no phase knob, just a polarity switch. Mm -hmm. And the Cube series provides three presets for in-room against the wall or in-corner placement, because apparently you can't fit it in the cabinet. <laughs> RC, and it doesn't go in, it doesn't go in apartments either. Nope. You're not allowed. <laughs> I wonder how different R those curves could really be, but... Regardless. R yeah, and <laughs> Who cares? RCA and speaker wire inputs are present as well as the connection port for Kef's optional wireless kit. Mm -hmm. The Cube 12 MIE, 1000 bucks. Cube 10 MIE, 800 bucks, And Cube 8 MIE, $600 are all pretty much self-explanatory. Prices remain the same as outgoing Cube series subs, as do the specs. So, yeah, that's the thing. That is right. it. That's it for Kef's new subwoofer lineup. Not exactly a gigantic change from what was before, but the Cube series gets this music integrity engine, their DSP control that wasn't in the previous uh, Cube series. And so you select the thing. Select the what? Select, select the thing. Select the, the placement. Select the placement choice. Where it is. It's, That's right. It's, it's That knob could literally, it could be like the... It's um, not a knob. It's a switch. The control, the 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 button that you press to cross the street that doesn't actually connect to anything. <laughs> it just makes you feel better. I think it could be like placebo that. Placebo button, okay. Yes. But I, I am a little disappointed in all of these, including that new flagship KC92, having no fully variable phase. Uh, that's that's yeah, a bit you, of a You made that clear by how you wrote this up. Yes. I, yes. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I would that... sacrifice the ground lift switch for a fully variable phase, please. Yes. Oh. I would sacrifice that MIE thing for it for sure. <laughs> okay. Frankly, we had for, uh, sort of forgotten that Voodoo was sold off uh, by Walmart to Fandango all the way back in 2020. We were a little busy in 2020. True. From then until now, Fandango didn't seem to make any notable changes to Voodoo as a service other than sticking their own name directly under the Voodoo logo. But now the name Voodoo is going away entirely and this place is Fandango at home. Yep. 
Thankfully, Fandango is reassuring everyone because no one's ever been disappointed by a company with who has been giving them reassurances that things won't change. But also, you nothing, know, the whole, uh, you know, one streaming service goes yeah. away, gets replaced with another. What yeah. happens to your purchased, quote unquote, the movies that you bought on this service? What happens to those? Gosh, haven't had any misgivings about that recently, have we? <laughs> Sarcasm. So they're reassuring everyone that nothing about the service itself or your digital library is changing them and Sony. This is a change of name only. They will be adding the option to link your Fandango movie ticket account to your Fandango at home login together. But they warned that Fandango gift cards will only work for Fandango movie tickets, not for Fandango at home. So (laughs) whatever. Yes. Couldn't possibly any be any confusion about that coming up. But uh, that's Mm. that's the thing. Upshot being, if you've continued to use Voodoo, expect that name to disappear. Expect to see Fandango at home in its place. But supposedly, That'll other than the name change, nothing else changes. <laughs> yeah. The little app button is definitely going to put some name Fandango on there. It's going to be a new logo. So according to a report in the Wall Street Journal, Walmart is in talks to buy Vizio for a little over $2 billion. That can only make the quality of Vizio better as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Expect Maybe. quality control to shoot way up. Maybe in about six years, it'll be Fandango Vizio. <laughs> Vizio Fandango. That's right. It only plays your at-home library. <laughs> it doesn't do anything else. At this point, point, it must be considered just a rumor, but Walmart is reportedly interested in acquiring Vizio's customer data and smart TV and advertising platforms. Yep. Oh, thank you. Mm. Thank you, Vizio. Selling my data. I don't have you know, physio products, but selling our data to Walmart because that's what Walmart needs. <laughs> Walmart already has their own house brand TVs under the name Own, O-N-N. I did not know this because I don't go to Walmart. But yeah. Vizio would be a more recognizable brand. Plus, it was never publicly known which OEM was making Walmart's own TVs behind the scenes. It's entirely possible Vizio was doing it all along. Vizio attempted to sell itself to Le- Echo back in 2016. Also for around two billion at the time, so basically, it's not even a, there's not even inflation. Nope. <laughs> the deal fell through, and does Echo still exist? I feel like it doesn't. I'm Is sure they're thing? still around, but they they seem to have completely abandoned their overtures of entering the North American market. Uh, okay. that, that seems to be what it had. They're they're still around in China. Okay, well, Echo sounds very French, but I guess I know. you don't have to be French to put la. In front of I mean, hey, it could be a wall instead. That's a much better name, isn't it? So the deal fell through and Vizio wound up successfully suing and settling with La Echo for 60, excuse me, $60 million. Yeah. So I guess that's one way to go. Yeah. That's how, so, maybe they'll get in talks and then Vizio just keeps suing people for not buying them. <laughs> and that's how they're going to make money. Right. It's a, it's a pyramid scheme. It's the, it's a Ponzi scheme. TiVo method of staying afloat. <laughs> <laughs> 2026 will basically mark the end of the traditional UHP lamp-based projectors, at least in the European Union. I Mm -hmm. saw this. Uh, An EU regulation uh, concerning products that contain mercury has been amended and will automatically go into effect across the entire EU starting in 2026. The amended regulation makes the sale or importation of any mercury-containing products illegal. Stock on hand at the time will be allowed to be sold, but EU retailers won't be able to bring in any more UHP lamp base projectors or replacement bulbs yeah. buy them now kids well that would be the upshot if you're planning to keep your projector for a good long time you well, probably want to have a replacement bulbs, lamp so yeah. is that they don't necessarily stay fresh <laughs> forever even if they've you know what i mean they should still perform Stored very properly, well for a very they long they should have a perfectly long shelf life yeah. you know without having been used yeah. i know yeah yeah. Humidity <laughs> can sometimes yeah. be an issue. Yeah. <laughs> Flooding. You know, my, the things that happen to my house. Uh, while this law is only in the books in the EU, it will likely impact UHP lamp market as a whole. We're already seeing more and more laser-based and LED light engine projectors anyways, but we've rem- uh, remained fans of the easily replaced lamps in projectors rather than basically have to replace the entire projector once the laser or LED light source starts to dim too much i actually have a projector in for review mm-hmm. like a portable one yeah it's battery and everything i'm gonna be That's almost certainly led light source in that case yeah yeah oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah comments from our listeners jack 
heard Jonathan Swoes about wanting to go streaming only about finding the delay too long when watching live sports and still trying to participate in the group chat he was going he has going with his friends, some of whom are often in the stadium watching the game in person. First of all, I just want to say that those friends aren't good friends. They should take you. That would be the solution. Yeah. Bring me along. Jack thought of him when he came across the Verge's article that cites Phoenix's... What is this? What is yeah. this word? That that's how they say uh, P H E N I X. They're a company that sells their own streaming out, technology. Hear. Okay, that's a Skype thing. Oh. Anyway, yeah, they're a company that sells their own streaming yeah. technology. That's who they are. All right, Phoenix figures for the average delay across a bunch of different streaming services. All all that showed the year Super Bowl, so NFL. I mean, anyway, so it it varies from about forty something. But 43 seconds at best for Paramount Plus up to yeah. uh, almost a minute Nearly. and a half for, for yeah. Fubo. <laughs> CBS Fubo. Yep. CBS YouTube. CBS Hulu. Wow, they're all over the place. Yes. Hmm. Oh, the number's on there. I was looking at the bottom thing and trying to no, figure this out. Printed right there. Just by looking at the line, I was like, how does Rob know it's exactly 43? It's not 42.73. <laughs> That's it. Phoenix is a streaming technology company that sells their own low latency video solutions. So take what they say with a grain of salt. But there wasn't anything particularly suspicious about their findings. That over-the-air broadcast TV was still the least delay, averaging about 22 seconds compared to real life. And out of the cable TV companies, uh, Verizon Fios scored the best with a 29-second delay on average. Some cable providers were slower than the best streaming option, though, which apparently was Paramount Plus. But good luck navigating their crappy menus. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they've changed it in a year since I've used it, but they probably haven't. Anyways, nobody has a, a solution for Jonathan yet, but at least he's not alone. And he is not the only one wishing live streaming were much better. So perhaps in time, this is, the situation will improve. Or he could just get a TV antenna and shut up about it. Well, but. that's that's the the fastest one, but uh, of course, only works if it is on a broadcast channel. I mean, CBS would have worked. That's a broadcast channel you could get with an over the air antenna. But yeah, yeah quite often the a, game you yeah. want to watch not on broadcast TV. Nathan was glad to hear us talk about the player-led Dolby Vision trick that can be used in order to output Dolby Vision signals to non-Dolby Vision displays, such as most HDR-capable projectors. We mm -hmm. talked about using an HD Fury device and noted how the least expensive model can perform this low-latency Dolby Vision hack is still 250 bucks. Yeah. So he says, well, if, and this is a fairly big if, but if your display can manually be put into HDR mode, regardless of the incoming signal, which is JVC projector can, then the folks over at AVS Forum figured out a way to use a much less expensive device. And if you're willing to dive into uploading custom firmware to this $30 device, this is already too complicated for me, <laughs> you can get even more customized results. Yes. He went with an HDMI splitter that can alter the EDID between your display and your source from a brand called AV Star. AV Star, watch it fall. Uh, Nathan, <laughs> sorry. perfect. Nathan, Nathan has detailed in length his full process, sharing the links to the original AVS forum threads as well on his own personal newsletter, which we will link up. Apparently, we'll have a link book. for it. I don't know where else to point you for all this put, information. That so in your newsletter, make sure you put an, an ad for AV because you know, we're <laughs> talking you up that there we get we, it's reciprocity baby that's right he wants to stress that it's not necessary to go to the same extent of customization customizing both the hdmi splitter and your projector's own gamma and tone map settings he went whole hog and detailed all of it if you just want to make dolby vision signals compatible and viewable on your non-dolby vision display you can use an hdmi splitter with edid editing straight out of the box and get functional results for about 30 bucks but if your display will only go into HDR mode in response to a flag in the signal, you still end up needing an HD Fury device. Yeah. He also notes that the Apple TV 4K ends up being one of the best partners with this setup because you can set it to always output Dolby Vision no matter what the original signal was, even SCR. Mm -hmm. And it actually does a good job of mapping any original video signal and putting it in a Dolby Vision container. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess that's true. Yep. For physical discs, the fact that Sony's Ultra HD Blu-ray players require manually turning Dolby Vision on and off ends up being a help in this case. Again, you can output everything in Dolby Vision using a Sony disc player, but you wouldn't want to do so for SDR content since it does not do a good job of mapping <laughs> SDR to, to, into a Dolby Vision container. doesn't do a good job of mapping it to an HDR container, either, but that's just for <laughs> well, me. No, I, no, you're doing... Uh, mapping HDR down HDR to SDR. HDR to SDR. That's, yeah. yeah, that's conversion, yeah. 
for all HDR content, though, this method lets you tone map everything before it reaches your projector, so it can see, so it can be a noticeable improvement over projector stock HDR10 tone mappy, tone mapping. Mm -hmm. Happy hacking, he says. Yep. So I was unaware of this. I I didn't know that uh, it is possible not in every situation there's a whole bunch of caveats to this yeah. but that it is possible to do this with uh, such a significantly less expensive device so that's great information if you're the type of person who likes to tinker and dig into this stuff then all the information is there we'll have the link to his Substack where he's posted all of this so correction this week we have been taken to task by mr know your tech on youtube mm -hmm. we have been taken to task have we yes like specifically in like a comment they Oh, in a comment. That's right. not, not like on another video. We I don't know. Like... I didn't go looking. Possibly no. we were. But in a comment, for sure. Okay. Last week, you said that Marantz's new Cinema 30 receiver shared identical features with the Denon X6800H, which cost $1,000 less, but we can confirm that is not entirely accurate. Mm -hmm. The Marantz Cinema 30 has a toroidal power transformer, because I hate saying that word, because it <laughs> makes my mouth go weird. Yep. Instead of the L... E I E I E I E I. Okay, that's an I and a capital I and it not is. a lowercase L. That's correct. E I power transformer in the X sixty hundred sixty eight hundred H. It also gets Marantz's quote monolithic power design unquote layout inside that is more akin to the previous Matt Marantz flagship receiver, uh, the SR eighty fifteen. Furthermore, some of its connections are gold plated on that's the back. Right. We'll find that. And it is specced as using a different set of processing chips and DACs, which Mr. Mr. Know Your Text declares are, quote, better, unquote. Uh -huh. To which I say, quote, BS, unquote. <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> they are different. I will give yep. you that, that they yep. are not identical. And we said yes. they were identical, but not identical. I defy anybody to hear a difference in these two units. That's but, right. But objectively, okay. there is no question about it. We do not contest this whatsoever. There are differences. Objective differences between the yes. two models. Objectively. Yep. Different. I'm objecting to the fact that you're saying they're different, but whatever. So there it is. In terms of what you can do with the Cinema 30 versus the X6800H, that might all be exactly the same, but they are not identical receivers with nothing more than different looks on the outside there really are differences inside too certainly worth many ones of dollars mm. not a thousand nope <laughs> we will stand by that <laughs> i'd be very maybe happy tens to get... of dollars maybe tens of dollars the gold plating does nothing no offense <laughs> I I'd be very care. happy to get oh. an X6800H. I, I would oh, not spend a thousand dollars more for the. I'd, I'll take the thousand dollars, put it in room treatments, yep. and my X6800H sounds way better than that Morantz. There it is. <laughs> Questions, Preston. I don't like the name Preston. We're going to skip this one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a weird way to start, man. <laughs> I know. Do I know somebody named Preston? I feel like Probably. I do. Probably. It's a fairly I common name. I know name. this guy. Maybe this is the guy. It might I know. be. This Could might be, be the Preston you know. Maybe that's why the one answer the question. <laughs> I'm tired. Yep. And that makes me loopy. I'm sorry, Preston. Yep. I take it back. You're a very nice person with a wonderful name. Just rolls off the tongue. Preston. At least it's not Toroy. It's I know. Because I'm not even trying to say it again. I got it out once. I'm good. <laughs> Preston says, Ertings has just started <laughs> dipping their toes into projector reviews. They have posted an article to go along with version point. 8, 0 0.8 or whatever, mm -hmm. of their testing methodology, which they are still developing and actively seeking help from their reader community to expand and refine. Uh, and their primer article, Primer? Primer. I mean, Americans primer. would say Primer. I would not. I would Up say here, Primer. Yeah, we, we would typically say Primer in Canada as far as I'm aware, but some people get very upset. This is well, a, a thing to... I feel like Preston says Primer. I, could well, I be. think that I think that there's a thing to prepare that. you to educate you beforehand. It primes, therefore, it primes, is a primer, but it's a primer. I don't know. It's not a primer. That's a dumb. That's a dumb way to say. Well, that I'm, I'm. If I say primer as a Canadian, I don't think I'm going to get too many complaints. You might, as an American, get complaints for Bring saying it. primer instead of primer. <laughs> please, please, 
if that's that's the worst you got on me today. You know, I've done Mr. like look, 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 poor Preston. Where is Mr. Know Your Pronunciation? Under the bus. Know your American pronunciation, Mr. Know Your American Pronunciation. Please come and fill up our comments. Yeah, do a three-hour video on why we suck. Yes. In the Primer article titled <laughs> "Low Brightness, Poor Contrast," they basically claim immediately that even the lowest contrast LCD flat panel TVs using IS, IPS panels. <laughs> Easily outperform all of their 22 projectors they've tested thus far, and the most expensive of which, and the highest scoring uh, for movie watching, is the Epson 5050UB. Which, by the way, I don't know if I sent you that article. You, you can they now have the like the refurbished store. The oh gosh, store I forgot over to mention Epson. that. Yes, yeah, we're mentioning so it now. You, go over to AV Gadgets. I wrote an article about it. They okay. the 5050UB is in there along with a mm. bunch of. Uh, couple year old sure uh ultra short throw projectors that you can get and i think one of them is the one that comes with the screen then it's like oh, yeah. super it's like they're reasonably priced like a yeah, couple yeah, of grand yeah. maybe even less i think one of them's like 1300 bucks or something like that mm -hmm. so av gadgets i'll find the article and i'll link it up or whatever okay. anyways 5050 ub is their their highest scoring one unsurprisingly for rentings they seem to be almost completely focused on brightness and contrast but also spend a good amount of the article talking about uh, white light output versus color light output that largely seems to have stemmed from the fact that they have chosen ANSI lumens and ANSI contrast uh, as their primary metrics for posting in their reviews as the basis for the comparisons and evaluations. And since both ANSI measurements only use white light, they have endeavored to explain how ANSI figures can potentially be gamed by manufacturers, so they are measuring individual color brightness uh, as well as a bulwark against potentially misleading figures. Uh, the article goes on to describe the efforts they have gone to in order to construct an ideal testing room. It's dark. One would guess immediately, and now we will find out. <laughs> One with dark and black. Those are the mm -hmm. two things it is, just in case you're wondering. All the room surfaces have been painted black, and the floor has been completely covered in a non-reflective black carpet. They're using a Stuart film. Oh, God. Don't tell what's his name. <laughs> They're Carl. using a Stuart film screen, Studio Tech 100 white screen, with a completely neutral 1.0 gain and virtually perfect Lambert, Lambert, Lambertian. Lambertian diffusion. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they admit that what they have constructed does not meet the extremely stringent standards for actual ANSI measurements, so they refer to their data as ANSI-ish. And they have images. I don't know if this is really the final version uh, that they posted online, but that they posted images of their blacked out room. And you can plainly see, even with the lights on, a reflection of the image that's on the screen on the side walls, the black painted side walls. You can clearly see light yeah. reflecting off of yeah. those black side walls. So this definitely would not meet an ANSI standardized I don't room understand why they have tables in here that... <laughs> are not black are, again are not black. I, that's probably not the final thing because they talk about the multiple the multiple things that surprised them in their efforts to create a standardized measurement room so we're, we're getting to that in a bit they also describe how they were taken aback by just how large a difference uh was measured from something as simple as the person taking the measurements either wearing a t-shirt versus a long-sleeved black turtleneck yep. god love you <laughs> everybody's gonna be in there with those zen zuni suits you know what i'm talking about the the I don't know that name, but yeah, that's the it's all spandex and you're fully covered. You know, like oh, yes. the green the green guys. That, yes, except it's gonna have to be a black. Except one. it's all black. <laughs> yes, you can get those at spirit places when they okay. exist. I think yeah. that that thing Makes has been sense. sued that existence. Anyways, they have a they, so they have standardized what anyone inside the testing room must wear, and they fully admit that the errors in their measurements compound. Oh my god, it's gonna get racial. It's going to have to get racial, right? <laughs> Are they going to have to get racial? Like, I'm sorry, you're too white to go in this room and measure Or they the can do time? the thing where they, you know... Why would paint, you even be in the room? Paint everybody's skin before they go in there, which couldn't have any consequences if there how are photos that of that. How could possibly backfire? <laughs> could they, how could the take picture photos erupt? Of how yes. could the picture erupt? <laughs> Jesus. <sighs> Routings, I... It was nice while we knew you. Uh, I, I, we'll remember you before you were canceled, in case you're wondering. Right. Furthermore, since they have no idea what any given customer's room and viewing environment are like, 
The best they can hope to provide is an approximate apples to apples comparison and a general sense of whether one projector is brighter, has higher contrast, and has higher br light, uh, color brightness than another. Preston wants to hear our thoughts on all of it. I mean, I think this is phenomenal. <laughs> just, just, I want to see what they look like while they're testing it. There's he also that. has one question in particular he would like us to address. Rutens <laughs> explain why they have chosen ANSI contrast as their primary metric, but in Preston's personal experience, full on, full off contrast with. Out an active iris or other form of dimming seems to be just as or possibly even more important. The ANSI checkerboard that can indicate one particular aspect of performance in a scenario where a scene is calling for maximum peak highlights and the black is black possible all at the same time, but many, perhaps most scenes in the movie are composed intentionally with much, much lower interest scene contrast. So it ends up being a total range uh ends up being the total range in average picture level that makes one projector seem bright and vibrant and then the projectors seem dull and lifeless and Preston thinks that full on full off contrast which ratings isn't even publishing in these early reviews does a better job of indicating that facet of performance he knows that Erton's uh, current metrics end up uh, placing mediocre projectors near the top of their, uh, their score simply because they measure a tiny bit higher in ANSI contrast and measure brighter in terms of nits coming off their 100 inch white screen never mind that they clearly have worse plaque levels or just plain easy to spot uh, as looking less impressive than some of the other models they've tested so we asked what do we think coming up with the testing met methodology I'm, uh, I, I've been poking fun this whole time because it's fun for me Right. And it keeps me awake and you've, you've by the been, way if you hear you've snoring been through the process <laughs> if you hear snoring it is not me Okay. I know it looks like it might be me. Mm. I might be dozing off. There's a very large dog in the room yep. on the floor, and he is snoring up a storm <laughs> down there. He is asleep. I haven't noticed it yet, but uh, yeah. Believe me, be. that boy that boy can saw some logs. <laughs> and he just came back. He was at the, the Southeast Guide Dog Center for mm. two weeks because of things he had to do while he was there. So he's he's been playing hard since he got back. Uh, so coming up with a... Uh, a measurement, a way of measuring anything mm -hmm. is always a compromise. There is no perfect solution. There's always going to be some somebody who's going to say, ooh, why didn't you do it this way? Or, mm -hmm. oh, we could have gotten better or uh, more accurate results if we did it this way. Or this is more true to life or that is more true to life. Um, that's why for my reviews, for the most part, I don't care. And I, I, I do that not because I because I'm like, well, I, I, I'm everything's subjective. I don't think that's the case. I, I think that the, the things that we care about, and this is kind of what Preston is getting to here, I think, is the things that we care about are things that actually matter. <laughs> like things that, that <laughs> things that you can see. Well, it is like, the the end subjective evaluation that yes. we ultimately care about, sure. And and those things are not really hard to detect in most cases like mm. when we talk about speakers and stuff like that you and i talk about this all the time you know the the big differences between speakers mm -hmm. you don't have to have be a golden ear or have a microphone measurement microphone or do a bunch of tests or anything or else. let it break in for two weeks before you we can possibly detect stuff. it nope you it happens right away we'll hear it right away yeah. it is not that hard uh and so what ratings, ratings or ratings is trying to do <laughs> is they're trying to come up with an objective measurement yes for how to uh, that will allow them to rate displays projectors yep. against each other and yep. we have and by we i mean of course rob have had issues with how they do that with flat panels already because sure. they over they're they're too worried about brightness or lumens or they, whatever i mean they seem to about. really really care about the light output spec yes right i'm sorry this chair is very uncomfortable <laughs> I'm trying to get comfortable over yes. here uh so with projectors, it's even harder because yeah. you're, you're you're dealing with reflect, not a direct light. You're there are with even more light. variables to consider here. Yes, and you know there's uh, there's a reason why like the Spears and Munsell discs are mm -hmm. full of test patterns. Yep. I mean, because if the, if there was one test pattern that showed you how right. good a projector yes. was, yeah, it would be 
one test the one pattern, test pattern you know, yes, yeah. or even a handful, but it's yeah. not. It's discs and discs right. of test patterns yeah. to show performance of a projector. You know, so what do I care about in the projector? What does Rob care about in the projector? Mm. What does Preston care about in the projector? You know, these are three different things. You know, when a bike comes into our bike shop, uh, I we often say this. There's some. There's what you think is wrong with the bike. There's what I think is wrong with the bike, and there's what's actually wrong with the bike. And those are three completely different things. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing with what a display is. You know, what display is right for you, or what display mm -hmm. you think is the best. So they're trying to come up with an objective measurement yeah. for that, and you're 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 they're running into the same problem that everybody runs into mm -hmm. is that. You you you're like this objectively shows that this one is better than that one, but when I look at them, that one the first one is clearly not better. Right. <laughs> Even though it measures better, like I am looking at this and this sucks. Like right. I can tell you that it sucks, and everyone else in this room can tell you that it sucks. So what you need to do is, and this is what we do in uh, when we do psychological research or just you know, uh, qualitative and quantitative data collection and stuff is you take objective data mm -hmm. and then you take subjective data and then you compare them. You try to correlate between the two. And if they don't correlate, then you want the, 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 the usual thing is, okay, one of the data collection methods was wrong. Mm. Or maybe both of them were, but you're hoping that only one of them was, so that one of them can be right. <laughs> so you 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 try to kind of figure that sort of stuff out, and that's what they're running into right now. Is I, they're they're deep into the objective part of it, yeah. trying to figure out exactly what things that they should care about. But they're gonna find out that if they're not careful, they're gonna end up with reviews and and ratings that say, well, by the measurements, this one is the best that we've ever tested mm -hmm. but subjectively it only it's milling and right. that's not a review anybody wants to read they need to find a way to objectively measure their their projectors in a way that shows uh that the, that agrees with people's including theirs subjective experiences with those and projectors from my perspective to defend ratings at this moment a little bit um yeah. do not panic <laughs> yeah. do not oh, this panic is early days it because sounds like. yeah i mean there's a reason they haven't called this methodology 1.0 yet there's a yes. reason why they're calling this a decibel a 0 0.8 methodology uh they're being upfront with the fact that this is very very much a work in progress and that what they're attempting to do is include their community of readers because they know they have some exceedingly knowledgeable readers amongst right. their viewership. And to, to include them in this process, make the whole process of developing the methodology public and talk about it openly. And like to some extent, if you're just looking for someone you can you can point someone who knows nothing about projectors and say, this is the authority, trust everything they say, if they're going to be open about the fact that they don't know everything yet, then maybe that lowers your confidence a little bit. But on the other side of it, yeah. I, I, I appreciate yeah. that they are being this open about what they're doing. I mean, it's very clear in the in the beta reviews that they, they clearly label like, this is obviously not the, the final thing that we're going to be offering to people. Um, you know, there's tons of things that they have mentioned already. Oh yeah. We're going to be measuring fan noise, right? They don't have that listed in the one, the 22 that they've done so far, but they're going to, cause they know that's an important thing, right? They right. don't, they don't have like the video processing tests in there yet that they obviously know how to do with their flat panels, but who there could be other variables when doing, you know, trying to measure those things on a projector they haven't dug into all of that yet and they know that they're going to they know that they have to they're trying to get at what they feel and i don't disagree with them that like contrast and light output are two very important metrics when it comes sure. to projectors and they're trying to get that right before they move on to the next part of the process and i don't i i don't personally see anything wrong with that the only issue is if you're going to say you know type in epson 5050 ub review and ratings current one that they've posted on their website pops up and you think that this is a completed review and you base your purchasing decision off that they could maybe do a little bit better job of really highlighting at the top of their projector reviews hey 
this is this is not done. <laughs> don't don't take this as any sort of gospel at this moment. Right. They could maybe do a slightly better job of, of labeling that up front. But but I'll defend them a bit in, in what they're going through because I mean, I find it kind of a, a little bit humorous on the one side of it's like, oh yeah, like I've been reading Projector Central projector reviews, um, you know, a few other projector review websites, like I've been reading them for years and years and years. They ran into all of this stuff too, right? You know, yeah. when they were very first starting, they're like, oh, you know, we thought that measuring this was enough. Turns out we had to measure like five other things along with it to get a better indication of how we're going to respond to it subjectively when we go and view this thing. Are, I, I have quite a bit of faith that ratings is going to be able to discover all those same things for themselves. Yeah. Bobby. It's been a while since we've heard from Bobby, and that's because after we helped him out with several decisions about his home theater, he was just happily enjoying it. And he wasn't looking for to do any improvements or upgrades until now. He's been using a 65-inch Vizio. Uh-oh. <laughs> They've been collecting your data. Did you know that? They're about to sell it to Walmart. Yep. <laughs> It's been using a 65-inch Vizio TV and the Epson 8350 projector on the 92-inch manual pull-down screen that comes down in front of his Vizio. He's been mm -hmm. noticing the falling prices on the 85-inch and even 98-inch TVs recently, and that has him thinking he's just going to ditch the projector setup entirely. Welcome to my thought process, sir. Yes, and, you know, ratings is coming in a little bit late for you. <laughs> yeah. He'd like to have uh, considerably better black levels and to get what he really wants with a projector. He knows he wouldn't be happy with anything less than the JVC, which mm. are pricey. And if you Not live in the UK... Cheap. Yeah, that MP5 that we like so much with the lamp-based. After yeah. 2026, if you're in the EU, we know he's not, but if you, yeah. if you were... But when he looks at those prices, he takes into account that he wouldn't be going any larger than his current 92-inch screen size. It seems like getting an 85-inch flat panel and either putting it on the stand or using a mount that articulates it out from the wall a bit is just a better deal all around. Do we agree? I mean, could I not agree more? Is that not <laughs> what I've been telling you I'm going to do in my own home theater? Mm. Of course I agree. Yes, you should do that. Do that. Do the thing you just said. I thing. also agree. Yeah, I mean, from 85 or, as I'm going to mention, 83 uh, versus 92. Yeah. Uh, yeah, basically, if you can make the distance from eyes to screen about a foot shorter, yeah. which is quite easy to do when transitioning from a projector screen to a flat panel, because if the flat panel just stands on a TV stand, very easy to have that screen one foot closer. Or like you say, if you're insisting on wall mounting it, you can definitely get articulating wall mounts that can bring it a foot out from the wall. Um, so yeah, I am in full agreement. I think this is the right thing to do. I think the, the value proposition, if you are not going to go larger than 92 inches, I think the value proposition for getting an 85 inch flat panel is, is very, very high. Put it on a stand. Yeah. Put it on the stand, and that will give you your foot plus some. You'll actually get a larger field of view. It'll be kind of nice. So he asked what 85-inch TV should he get. He's been keeping an eye on the prices for the TCL. You want to oh, well, OLED if you can get one. Well, this is the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, he's been keeping an eye on the prices for the TCL QM8, which is $2,200 on sale. It's on the X90L, $2,200 on sale. And Samsung QN90C, $2,400 on sale. His room mm -hmm. is at fully light controlled and movies mm -hmm. are his top priority. He does a little bit of gaming, but it isn't critical to him to have the absolute big gaming performance. What do we, uh, what, what would we recommend most highly? You want an OLED, sir. That is the thing, but... I know they're he's expensive. Got, he's got very much a price range that we yeah. are noticing right here, 22 yeah, to $2,400. $2, <laughs> and to go with an 83-inch OLED will be more expensive yeah. than that. So, I mean, of course, I'm I mean, just that, that's perfectly say reasonable. <laughs> that you should just wait a little bit longer. I mean, unless right. your projector is dying, unless anything's going on, I think that you should wait. And this is why. Because you are going to spend a, a enormous sum of I, as far as I'm concerned, two hundred two thousand dollars is an enormous sum of money. Sure, three thousand dollars is also an enormous sum yep. of money to spend on a TV. Four thousand dollars is an enormous sum. Yes, and for, they're all the same amount of money. I mean, they are different <laughs> amounts of money. They are all enormous. Okay. Okay. So, but... and I understand that you don't have all that money right now, or maybe you sure. don't want to spend all that money right now. So you have two options: you need more money, mm -hmm. which maybe is not an option. Or you need to wait for the prices to come down to where you have the amount of right. money you have will match the the OLED that you clearly desire. And you should desire it because you want black levels. And you said right. it. You started it off. You knew what we were going to say. You wanted us to convince you that to get an OLED. 
you wanted us to do that, and now I am. I mean, that's very what. much some projection coming from Tom there. That uh, I also want to know. Wanna know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I, I would very much like Bobby to get an OLED because I mean the thing is you're not just replacing your projector you're also replacing your yes. video yes I mean that that yes. oh, oh, clearly that's what's going on here yes and so th this is one of those situations where I mean we're the people who are very often when when all other sources online are telling people to spend more money yes. or spend their way to a solution we're very often the ones maybe sometimes the only ones saying don't spend your money or spend fact, considerably don't buy anything or, or spend considerably <laughs> I less say money. that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that we're the ones who do that. This is a situation where we're saying it is more money. So at the moment, at the moment right now as we're recording this, if you were to get an 83-inch uh, LG C3 OLED, which I will tell you as a now G3 owner, and I got the 77-inch that had the micro lens array panel. That, that objectively is capable of measuring brighter highlights than the right. C3. At the 83-inch size, the, the G series does not have the micro lens array panel. It has an additional heat sink on the back, so the G3 at the 83-inch size is objectively able to measure a little bit brighter in the highlights than the C3. But I will tell you now, as a micro lens array G3 OLED owner, it is not a compelling enough difference to spend a thousand or fifteen hundred dollars more than the C3. The C3 is super, super impressive looking. And coming yeah. from your Vizio LCD TV and your 8350 projector, the C3 would blow your mind and yes. you are the type of person who would appreciate it. Yes. So like I say, at the moment, the 83-inch C3 is $4,000. Now, Samsung's OLEDs, they do not manufacture samsung display does not manufacture an 83 inch quantum dot oled but samsung electronics does sell an 83 inch s90c oled which uses the exact same oled panel as you would find in lg c3 the s90c is basically an lg c3 minus dolby vision and if you're okay with that you could get an 83 inch samsung s90c oled with the same panel as the LG C3 for $3,500 right now. So a $500 savings, essentially to give up Dolby Vision. That, that's really the, the true one objective difference that you could right. point to for that $500 cost savings. Now, look, that is $1,000 more than the 85-inch LCD TVs that you suggested that you were looking at. That is not chump change. That might take time to save up. This is the situation where I will say that is $1,000 you will not regret spending yes. if you did it. If you yeah. spent $3,500 for the 83-inch S90C OLED, you would be over the moon about the picture quality upgrade that you just got over both your Vizio TV and your Epson projector. So that's my real desire is for you to get one of those OLED models and that S90C is a very good deal at that 83 inch size. I will say that in LCD land, one of my favorites to just look at, <laughs> probably my favorite looking LCD TV is actually Sony's uh, high-end mini LED backlit 85-inch uh, television. There's two versions of it. They have an X93L uh, and an X95L, and there is a difference in that the X95L costs $1,200 more than the X93L and does have more zones of local dimming. But the X93L to me is like the butter zone the, of, of like really, really good, about as good as LCD get, about as close as a LCD TV gets to an OLED looking image. And it costs $3,800. So it's right at the same price point as the OLEDs. And I would tell you to get an OLED <laughs> over the X93L. Mm. But if you were saying, what's my favorite 85 inch LCD TV, it's Sony's X93L. But the price difference just isn't worth it to get that. What about the ones that he's looking at though? So do out of the ones you're looking at, because yeah. if you're saying, I really do want to get a TV now, I have $2,500 max to spend. I cannot stretch it to $3,500. I would get the TCL QM8 out of the three that you mentioned. 
I don't think the QN90C from Samsung is very impressive at all. I, I This is one of those years. Samsung has these sort of waffling years back and forth yeah. where sometimes their 4K LCDs are like, oh, those are really impressive. Perhaps the most impressive out of the major brands that's out there. And then some years they take this big old step back and the C from 2023, they took a big old step back. I don't think that QN90C is very impressive at all. And it was actually $200 more expensive than the other two you're looking at. The X90L, the Sony X90L, is going to be the right choice for some people. The issue I have with the X90L is that its black levels are just not inky black. Uh, What Sony chose to do is to try and avoid blooming as much as they could and make sure that you actually do have very accurate shadow detail. Like if you compared what can I see in this image compared to a mastering monitor, they did a really good job of that, like scaling it so that black is not as inky black as the mastering monitor. But in terms of seeing the detail just above black, the X90L does a really good job of that. It's a very nice TV to look at if you strongly favor accuracy to the original signal and creator's intent, and you're watching in a moderately lit room not a Mm. pitch black room not a fully light controlled room not a super bright room because it's not the super brightest tv either but in a moderately lit room and you super duper care about shadow detail and creator's intent on that end of the scale the x90l has its like advantages there but in terms of which of these tvs do you just turn on go oh wow what an impressive looking image it's the tcl qm8 That's the one that does it out of that group. It's also the least expensive. Hard to beat that. I will say there are some quirks that I don't love about the interface when you're doing all of your settings in TCL's TVs Mm. because you have to use the smartphone app to get all of the picture settings. Mm. Now, you only have to do that once or twice, but it is an annoyance that you can't actually do it just from the remote and the, what's built into the TV itself. You have to get the the smartphone app to access all the settings on the TCL. So there's that caveat in there. But in terms of which of those TVs is the most just sheer impressive to look at, mini LED backlighting, lots of local dimming zones, inky looking blacks, really, really bright and punchy when it want it to be, I would point you to the QM8. So I want you to get the OLED, but if you really can't afford it, get the QM8. Those would be my choices. All right. He's got a Denon X4400H receiver and all of his sources plug into that receiver with HDMI cables. Then a single HDMI cable goes to his TV and another to his projector. <laughs> his TV started cutting in and out, sometimes only audio, other times both audio and video. Then it, then it seemed to get even worse, completely failing to connect to the signal at all sometimes. Yeah. He pulled out his equipment rack to access the back of his AV receiver and he discovered that even the slightest touch of an HDMI cable will cause a signal drop out of some kind. He tried to but replacing some of the HDMI cables, and he tried both HDMI inputs on this Vizio TV, but there's always the same situation. He tried both the HDMI. Okay. Is there anything he can do? He's seen locking HDMI cable connectors that secure the HDMI jack using the little screw that's directly above each HDMI input. Would those do the trick? I would not trust that and not think that that would be a, a long-term solution. Um, he, I, are the Is his TV and projector the same resolution uh well i don't know what visio he has so yeah. i mean the 8350 is a 1080p sdr projector uh yeah. but i mean he wasn't having this issue before uh what what this really it this really does sound like some hdmi jack and maybe it's the monitor out of your av receiver because yeah. that's the common denominator in all of this um like simply due to heat and the fact that hdmi is just a lousy friction fit connector um it's probably just come a little bit loose right like you said you touch it just a little bit and the signal drops out completely right right? so that is the jack itself um that is it like if it's bad enough that is something that denon can repair uh depending on like 4400 h you're probably out of warranty at this point yeah yeah. so there there would probably be a, a a cost associated with it but that that is something that can be repaired um I mean, if you're willing to risk he's it, he's got some two people... outputs, though, right? Yeah, but he's using both of them, right? Because one goes to the TV and one goes. To That's the why I asked if they were both. I mean, he... so the solution is is if you're both if both your projector and your TV, which I don't think they are, are both the same resolution, you could just use a splitter and use this to the same. 
Uh, and I mean, since there's output. very much a possibility he's replacing his two displays with one, as that long as would... you have one functioning HDMI yeah. output on your AV receiver that can now feed your one 85 inch flat panel. Uh, yeah. And that might be the solution here. Uh, like this isn't a solution to what you're talking about, but this is one reason why I do personally prefer to use the thinnest and lightest HDMI cables that I can get away with. Because when you put a heavy HDMI yeah, cable, like just... I, I had some of those like original blue jeans HDMI cables yeah. that were like a freaking garden hose yeah uh like that was great for the signal back then you could run them way longer than anybody else's hdmi cables but like you could see just the sagging <laughs> like the, yeah. the sheer gravity weight which was no good for those hdmi uh ports so yeah i mean the, the locking thing that uses the little screws the denon does have that little screw above every single hdmi connection that it has um like if you were to combine that that locking mechanism with some thinner lighter weight <laughs> hdmi cables uh you know there is a chance that that would hold that just securely enough you know that you don't get these signal dropouts anymore but it, what it really sounds like to me is the monitor output on your denon most likely that's the jack that just just from heat from use from normal yeah. heat you didn't do anything wrong and just gravity of the hdmi cable Maybe he does have a little, long, like older, really heavy HDMI cable that's oh, back easily, there that's sure. doing yeah. that. You know, or, or maybe, maybe, he, maybe he pushed it back against a wall and it sure, just Sure, it, it flexed it. a little bit or yeah. um, got monster HDMI cables where they make the HDMI jack just a tiny bit too big. And you yeah. pulled it out and put it back in a couple of times. And that's loosened things up. But regardless, you, you, you didn't have to do anything wrong for this to happen. This happens quite frequently. So that is something that... Worst case scenario, Denon can fix. Uh, you can get that. Basically, they just replace the jack, and that's that's what fixes it. That that is something that can be repaired. There'd be a cost associated with it. So, uh, yeah, th there's not like a super like some people have you know been endeavoring they pull the back panel off of the chassis they go in there with a little pair of needle nose pliers and they just crimp it down a little bit to make yeah. that friction fit tighter again but that doesn't always get you a good connection to all 19 pairs of pins on yeah. the inside that's just the outside jacket that is grabbing a bit more tightly so yeah i, I wouldn't really hesitate to call denon about this because you're you're not talking about a uh like a really exhaustive internal repair this is literally just the jack needs to be replaced and that can be done yeah nick Back in September 2022, Apple released the second-gen AirPods Pro uh, earphones. Then in 2023, September also, they updated them by including a USB-C instead of a lightning cable charging case. But the AirPod Pros themselves remain the same, and Apple even refers to them as the second-gen AirPod Pro still. So, mm -hmm. do we have any idea whether there will be a, fu a full update to third-gen Apple Air... I'm sorry, it's my brain. It is late. That's okay. Uh, third generation AirPod Pro in September this year. He's willing to wait if a third generation is coming, but if there won't be a generation update until 2025, we'll go ahead and get a pair right now. I don't know. We truly do not know. We how, are not privy to know. any insider information. That said, the rumor mills out there that are reasonably accurate most years are suggesting they don't anticipate a new generation of AirPods Pro until 2025 at this point. They're just going they're, by the regular They're going to be cadence. very busy processing all of those Vision Pro review, uh, returns. Sure. The next. There is that going on. Uh, there is anticipation that like the AirPods not Pro or Max, but like the regular AirPods, very much there's anticipation that those will get updated this year, but that the AirPods Pro won't get updated until 2025. That seems to be the the general consensus amongst the rumor bill, but I don't know anything more than that. So uh, we'd have no in insider information. What about some second generation Beats Fit Pro earphones? He already gave his lightning cable AirPod Pro to his daughter because he wants to go all USB-C. Welcome to like five years ago with me, I guess. <laughs> with, yeah, when he's working out, he he's used to uh, he used to have push used to have to push the AirPod Pro back into his ears quite frequently, mm -hmm. and for certain exercises, he really couldn't wear them at all, or they will certainly fall out. Well, that's such a great design. Yeah. His current Beats Fit Pro came out uh, about ten months before the second gen AirPods Pro, so it could so could it end up being a similar situation again with the second gen Beats Fit. Pro coming before the third gen AirPods Pro. He's read how the little wing clips that hold the Beats Fit Pro inside your ears work great uh, for some people, but they get uncomfortable after an hour or so for others. So I guess he just have to try them out to find out if you like them personally, right? Yes, yeah. that is true with every single in-ear monitor. So the same question as before, should he buy some second... I don't think you should buy any of this stuff. 
Honestly, okay. so, I mean, there's just no reason to spend this kind well, of... Well, it's just the, right now he doesn't have a pair because he gave the AirPods Pro that he did have to his daughter, so he needs I something. I know, but why Why are we limited to the just Beats or Apple I mean, he, he wants all the features that work with his iPhone, so you kind of either got to get AirPods or Beats because Apple owns Beats, so you get all the features that you can do with an iPhone with those guys. Um, so yeah. again... Uh, again, no actual insider info, but the rumor mill out there is anticipating a second generation Beats Fit Pro this year. They are anticipating, again, basically just based on cadence of how these things have traditionally been released. Right. Uh, there is an expectation that the Beats Fit Pro will get a generation update sometime this year. So uh, in the end, I end up agreeing with Tom. I probably wouldn't buy anything right this second if you're able to wait, if you have an alternative you can use for the meantime. I think it's worth waiting uh, to, to see because the, the rumor mills are are usually fairly accurate about this sort of release date type of thing. And Beats Fit Pro uh, second generation are anticipated for 2024. Mm. All right. There you go. You have to have all that stuff. If not, there's like a bajillion. Andrew just did a review of uh, Earfun Air 2. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what it is. They don't do Anyways, all the iPhone features. They don't do all the iPhone they things. They don't but you have know what they Apple's do? own little wireless chip in there. They 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 cost less than fifty bucks, and they sound. They don't great. do the spatial <laughs> audio where the sounds seem to get you know stuck in space, and you can turn your head, and they the, the I sound had, stays I, I've fixed. I've reviewed earphones that have done that before. Hmm. It wasn't you know how many times I used it? Hmm. Who know. Just long enough to talk about it on the review and then turned it <laughs> off and used used them normal. If in the Gary, most of the major sport leagues offer at least some of their games on 4K now, but can mm-hmm. but you certainly cannot count on every game being broadcast or available on cable and 4K. No. Realistically, well, this is with the questions about things that we can't possibly know. What time frame do we predict? I don't I don't speculate. Uh, what time frame do we predict for when the vast majority of NFL, NLB, NBA, and NHL games will be available in 4K? Uh, 2031. Longer. Okay. Yeah, That's longer, realistic, I longer think. than you want for sure. Longer than you think it should take. Yeah. Uh, that's my anticipation. Because the the issue is, you know, the whole transition to 4K broadcast TV with HDR, all of that type of stuff, no mandates. There's no mandates for that. It's not like the transition from analog television broadcast to digital television broadcast, where there was a government mandate because they wanted to free up the, uh, the, the spectrum, the radio frequency spectrum. They wanted to free it up, auction some of it off, repurpose other, you know, frequency bands, all that type of thing. So they mandated that transition. And that, you know, forced all of the over-the-air broadcasters, all of the uh, major networks to upgrade all of their equipment and all of their editing flow and everything like that. It was a massive, massive change, technological change that they had to go through. But, you know, because there was this mandate, they did ultimately do it. There's no mandate to do this transition to ATSC 3.0, to go to 4K resolution, to go to HDR, none of these things. A lot of the 4K broadcasts that we're getting right now, the cameras are 1080p. The yeah. cameras are 1080p, but with HDR, with uh, with uh, uh, hybrid log gamma HDR, uh, and then they're being upscaled, and that hybrid log gamma is being converted into a Dolby Vision or an HDR10 container. So there's plenty of you know uh, changes and transcoding and thing going on, and upscaling going on. It's very high quality upscaling, but you know very often the cameras themselves are still 1080p resolution. So what is the incentive, right? Because streaming has found out that. By and large, people are not willing to pay extra for 4K. People yeah. want 4K. There, there, there is a a, a general out in the public uh, awareness of 4K. Everybody but, sees their 4K TVs. If you ask somebody, do you want your streaming service to be available in 4K? Very few people are going to outright say no. I, I, I just don't want that. But we've. We've got all the evidence now saying that what matters most is price, right? Yeah. People will definitely accept 1080p and not 4K if it costs less. I would be shocked if you if it if people who have regular Netflix aren't, don't think they have 4K. Oh, I, I know. Think, I think yeah, that because they, Netflix they, promotes how they they have yeah. 4K available. They so think they have think it. They have it. Oh, and, absolutely. And they, if you gave them actual 4K over Netflix, they'd be like, oh, I yeah. I guess that's different. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So 
you know, what is the what is the financial incentive for the yeah. broadcasters and the major networks to make this it's all very costly? I mean, it's, it's very co- like the very so costly. equipment, and the amount of you know, bandwidth, bandwidth that they have to move around else? for editing. Yeah, so I I think it's going to be a long time. Right, twenty twenty was supposed to be it. It was oh, yeah. supposed to be twenty twenty. I I'm going to Tom just threw out twenty thirty one. I think twenty thirty five. Okay, Let's see who's right. Get back to that's the, when you can ask your next question. <laughs> Bertrand in Quebec. Bertrand has been waiting for the movie Drive. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Ryan Gosling. To be released Jack. in 4K on Ultra HD Blu ray. There's already a UK version, and he could order it through Amazon Canada, but the sh- after the shipping fees would end up being close to $60 Canadian, all for Ryan Gosling to look forlornly off into the distance. Stay silent. Stare. Stare, stare, stare. Stare. It's a bit much. So, do we know why the North American version hasn't been released yet? And if it isn't coming anytime soon, do we have any tips for getting the 4K disc from the UK for uh, for a lower price? I don't have any tips for how you can import things. Um, ah. Yeah, unfortunately, I wish I did. I'm sure there are ways of doing it. Mm-hmm. Make a friend in the UK, have them buy it from Amazon. Even so, like, uh, like what one thing I have actually purchased. Uh, UK discs um, by ordering them through Amazon.co.uk. Uh, like even if they were available through Amazon.ca, I have sometimes ordered directly from Amazon.co.uk. Um, sometimes the final price that you end up paying is a couple of bucks less, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's not like significant. So if it ends up being $56 Canadian instead of $60 Canadian. I don't know if you're really considering that as a lower price. It is, it is technically and objectively lower, uh, but it's not going to be something significant. I don't have great tips on like, oh, there's there's some magical place in Canada you can order from where it's going to be 25 bucks. Nope, uh, not aware of anything like that. And, and Amazon kind of is the easiest, whether you're ordering through Amazon.ca or through .co.uk and just having them import it that way. Uh, so unfortunately, no, don't know that. Um, as far as why isn't there a North American release, it's all about which... Uh, distribution company has the rights to that movie in which country. It is a right. different distribution company that has the rights to the movie Drive in the UK. They decided that they thought there was enough of a market for that movie in the UK that it'd be worth their while to make the 4K release. We know the 4K version of the movie exists, right? Somebody had to scan it and put it on a disc. We know that file exists, but it's a different distribution company in North America that owns the rights to the movie Drive. So until that company in North America decides it's going to be worth their while to do it. Uh, we, we just have to wait or do the UK import. There you go. Uh, he's also very much looking forward to the 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray release of Aliens. At least mm-hmm. we know when that, uh, that, that, that we know that that one is coming soon. Yes. So what are Tom and Rob's most anticipated Ultra HD Blu-ray releases? You can guess that Tom's going to say The Crow, which AV Rent listener Jay also spotted when it was announced it was getting a 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray release on May 7th to celebrate his 30th anniversary. So any others. Um, I'll be honest with you. I would only buy The Crow again. And I have bought it many times. Yeah. <laughs> I would only buy it again. And I know this sounds stupid. Okay. okay? <laughs> but at the beginning, right after he turns into The Crow or whatever, and he yes. puts the makeup on, and he starts running across the ceiling, uh, running across the, the, the building, top of the buildings, right? He jumps and then lands and then there's like this you know there's music going on the music stops and he's like boom and he lands and he looks over the side or whatever whenever he hits the 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 ground at that point Mm -hmm. it should rumble my theater and it never has Mm. i would pay for a new disc if it did that okay anything else any other change that they may make is not enough (laughs) they must add base at that right. moment or i am i'm not pe- i'm not buying it again we will have to wait and see yes um there's so many movies i would buy in 4k okay like it, it like ultra hd blu-ray um if they came out if they remastered them and everything mm-hmm. i mean so i've got a, a a number of movies that i would watch at any given moment and some of them are not great movies or not movies that you may love or that that are high quality and that they will never see a 4K release. It's certainly not a remaster. They may just like throw it into a 4K container and it's going to look all grainy and crappy. But I talk about Big Trouble in Little China a lot because I mm-hmm. love that movie. Dangerous Liaisons, I would watch that movie at any moment. I would watch it right now 
and that's already in I think that's already in 4K. It's definitely in Blu-ray. I, I think don't know it if is, it's yeah, in 4K. I'm not sure. Um I would buy uh The Fifth Element for sure. Well, that's and, already available. <laughs> I, I think I already have to be honest with you. So I'm just thinking about movies in general that I would buy, you know, I don't know if they're available yet because I have most anticipated only one and only choice. I don't know. I'm going to say about you, go. Godzilla minus one. I'm very much looking forward to that. We know it's that's coming. A new movie that doesn't really count. I, I feel like this is like a. It's my most anticipated. That's that's the most anticipated 4K release. But uh, the one I want, it has not been announced. I've wanted it to come out, uh, especially for the HDR that it ought to have. Tron Legacy. Where is Tron Legacy in HDR? I I want that release. So it it hasn't been announced. But uh, that would be my most anticipated uh, if it were to be announced. Hmm. Okay. That's what Rob says, and I don't really yes. have one. Okay. Bob. Bob says he should have picked a cheaper hobby, but now he's hooked, and he has been visiting several audio forums. Well, there's a mistake right there. He recently <laughs> found our podcast on YouTube. He's been enjoying our episodes. He'd like to get our thoughts on a couple of questions. <laughs> okay, tell you what. There we go. First of all, Bob, I... Bob, right? Bob, yes. I, I apologize in advance for whatever we're about to say. He liked to get our thoughts on a couple of questions to our advice and to run counter to what he's mostly come across from the audio forums he has visited. Yeah. Yes. That is true. Yeah. So to set the scene, he cares about... Oh, he's got Magda Pants. He does. You're uh, seeing he most, ahead. He mostly cares about two-channel music performance. That's his priority, but he uses his system to watch movies, and he has a projection set up. Don't tell the other guys on the audio forum. <laughs> like, take when you... When you when you post pictures of your thing, first of all, read my article about not putting two subwoofers up front. Let's just start with that. We're going to be talking about that. Yes, you're <laughs> anticipating. Uh, his front left and right speakers are Magnapan uh, twenty point seven Magnaplaner speakers with tr with true ribbon tweeters that he bought used. He wouldn't have been able to afford them brand new. Thanks to all the informs, he bought a Sanders MagTech two channel amp to power them, also used. This is a case where. Dedicated amplifier for these speakers is probably. We don't mind important. a dedicated amplifier for Magnapan speakers. Yeah, that <laughs> they, is. That they kind of need it. Okay, yeah. so let, let's. Most people are like, oh, he's gonna, gonna, he's gonna crap they, all over his amplifiers. No, they I'm not. Dip very low in impedance at they some do. points, and they gobble up the watts. They do. So you got a uh, NAD T seven five eight V three receiver to act as a pre pro for his front speakers, and it also powers the center and surrounds when he watches movies. He stopped at five speaker setup because. Priorities two channel music, but he gets. And the right NAD now. came with Drac Live full bandwidth license for subwoofers. He picked up a pair of relatively new RSL Speedwoofer 12s. He placed them both at the front of his room on the other side of his center because mono. His NAD receiver only has a single subwoofer output, so he has daisy chained the two subs. That brings me to his first question. Several of all the forums he went to suggest he ought to have spent more on the subwoofers given his, his associated equipment, and he should have gotten better subwoofers. The REL in particular being recommended. With ah. REL, of course. That company can suck my... Can't finish that <laughs> sentence. That's how I feel about REL. There's a little preview, Bob. A little preview of what our answer is going to be. Yeah. Okay. Let me just say <laughs> that any company that, that spews the amount of misinformation they spew... <laughs> Will never get a recommendation from me. Yeah. Will never, I mean, it will never happen. Again, to make it clear once again, the REL subwoofers themselves are fine. not bad. <laughs> fine, fine performers. It's not, the company. Not worth tons more money than no. somebody else's no. very good subwoofers. And I don't want to spend all the time I'm going to have to spend talking you out of how they tell you to wire the dang thing up. So there's the. Well, app that too Th that's that's a little bit of this too so yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, just to in general get ahead of this a little bit uh bob how much do you want to be deprogrammed okay, yeah um, really because, i don't think you understand what you've walked into here yeah i'll be honest with you you walked into a room and i, I i'm trying to think of uh a, a, of a, an analogy that everybody would kind of understand but you know it's kind of like walking into like that control room at nasa mm. right and, uh, you know, where they're like, there's a space shuttle thingy happening or the IS, you know, like everybody's on headsets and they're yelling out telemetry and stuff like that. And somebody walks in and goes, hey, so the Earth's really flat, right? And <laughs> that is what you have just done. But for audio. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, the, the very good news here is, one... We're pretty big fans of your speakers. We, yeah. we, we like Magnapan speakers. I'm you know, perfectly like, fine with those. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, if you like the way they sound, we got no beef with that. Nope. Two... No, no. This is this is the case with with those speakers. 
having a really beefy two-channel external amplifier, we're actually on board with that. So Very much you're so. not going to get complaints from us here about that. That using that NAD receiver, I like that NAD receiver. That's actually not a, a crazy expensive receiver no. or something like that. It's yeah. a very, very good and quite reasonable choice. So we're not going to be the least bit angry about your choice of AV receiver and using its front left and right pre-outs to send to that beefy two-channel app to power your MagnaPan speaker. So g great news here. You're not going to get any flack from us for your no. choice of equipment that you've gone with. So at least we're starting from that good starting point. Two thumbs. Yes. <laughs> two, also, two, thumb, two thumbs for starting off on a on a high note. And I, I I really really like those RSL Speedwoofer 12s. They're a fantastic value. They're, they're we'll get into value. some specifics okay. here now. So, advice on how you should have connected uh, the pair of subwoofers varies greatly, especially if you spend any time reading the REL uh, yeah. misinformation site. So, you basically went with seem, what seemed like the the simplest method, but mainly it was to ask us: Do we think the RSL Speedwoofer 12s subs are Overall, good enough to keep up with this MagnaPan front speakers. Would it have been worth as well to save up for, uh, save up for a pair of better subwoofers from REL? At, well, clearly, you know what we're going to say about REL. The question is, should you have gotten better subwoofers? The <laughs> answer is, how big is your dang room, my man? It is all about the room. Like, I will tell you, in, in no completely unequivocally here, no, no caveats uh, associated with this answer, if... It turns out that your room size and the output capabilities of the RSL Speedwoofer 12S are a good match. I will say you have fantastic subwoofers. In no way is it necessary to spend more and upgrade them. The only instance where I'm going to say, yeah, it might be necessary to, to spend more than what the Speedwoofer 12S costs is when you get back to us, and hopefully you listen to this and you do, and you tell us the details about your room. We want to know dimensions, and we want to know, is it enclosed or is it open? And if it's open, if it has a permanent opening to some other part of your house, how much, right? Are we talking about you've used half of an enclosed room as your home theater area, and there's another half of this room that we can't see in the image? Or is this, it's in your great room with a vaulted ceiling and there's your kitchen and dining room and the hallway to the entire rest of the house you know behind this setup and you're you're trying to pressurize the entire you know house uh when you're playing your subwoofers it might be if you were trying to get to reference volume levels necessary to get more expensive higher output subwoofers than the speedwoofer 12s but if the room and the subs are a good match then there was absolutely no reason to spend more money i love those speedwoofer 12s's uh in terms of you know can they match nicely with some magnapan speakers they absolutely can unequivocally that is what i will say sorry i'm looking for links here yes there you go hold on hold on, hold on. almost got it and got it <laughs> and paste all right uh yeah so it's all about the size of your room and yep. what you know basically what it comes down to is you need to have a, a, and what Rob said, you need to have subwoofers that can pressurize your space. And we don't know what the size of your space is. And these subs are not incapable subs. And anybody- They're actually the, very capable subs. They're very good subwoofers. They're very good subs. Very linear. They're fine. But what people online do and what uh, SVS's stupid tool does as well <laughs> yeah. is it looks at the price of your speakers and says, you didn't spend enough on your subs. Sure. Which is not how these things work. Nope. Okay, um, you need the you need the subs that can play cleanly from twenty hertz up to wherever your magnet pans roll off at. Which mm -hmm. I don't know where it is, but I'm sure it's eighty hertz or lower. It's in that, right. or maybe maybe a little oh, bit yeah. higher than that. But whatever, the RSLs can do that just fine. Yes. Okay, but can they pressurize your space? Mm -hmm. We don't know because we don't know the size of your space. So we'll we'll. Talk about that when we get there. So he tried running Drac live more than once. Particularly, he wanted to compare what it sounded like using the disc-shaped mic that NAD included with the receiver versus the stock U mic one that everyone told him to buy. To his ears and subjective taste, he thinks the NAD mic won out by a hair. Then it didn't <laughs> win. It didn't win. Indeed. But that's okay. He had expected U mic one's result to sound better since it, would, since it cost more. Hey, right there. Let's just hold that thought in our mind. Yep. We thought... And by we, we mean you. You thought it would cost it cost more, therefore it would sound better. It should sound better because it costs more, okay? There are many aspects of life where cost and performance are linked. The more you spend, the better performance you'll get. Okay. Audio, unfortunately, 
is not really one of those places. I mean, uh, in the at, at the beginning phases, yes. there is there is definitely some correlation where, in general, you spend some more and you objectively and subjectively get better performance. But then you reach a bend, <laughs> right? Where that and that bend is not off. nearly as uh, expensive as high as you, think. As you think, yeah. think it is. <laughs> it is much lower than you think it is. So that's the thing that that you're going to run into is the the people online. Uh, do not think the same way we think, you know, no. when it comes to these things. Um, so when you are, uh, and I'll link up this too. I'll have to find the article. You need to go to avgadgets.com and just start reading everything I wrote, honestly. Sure. And I and I, I say that not as a, oh, you, I'm so smart. Rob and I have been talking about this. I have been talking about this for since 2007 on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Rob has been with me for what, 10 years now, something like that. I don't so, know. I have no idea. It's a long time. <laughs> so we have been talking about this stuff a long time. All yeah. my articles over at AV Gadgets are just things we have talked about over and over and mm-hmm. over again. And this is, is this is part of it. So, Definitely. you know, basically phrase your question as you would phrase it and okay. put it into the search bar and you might end up with the exact that's the name of the article. And <laughs> that, I want to take this I, moment that's to, that's I, I want to take this moment to stress we have absolutely no blame here for uh for for, for Bob, right? We ha- we completely get where you're coming no, from. Absolutely and we com- not. That you, there is you you have not done anything that is unreasonable uh because we know exactly the information that has been yeah. fed to you and and so much of it sounds reasonable and intuitively makes sense and all the rest of it so please don't take any that's why i asked how much you, do you want to be deprogrammed because it is a bit of a cult like sensibility when Ooh, you get a, into the high end i got an like end. that too yeah. <laughs> i got an, you, a, an audio an audio file audio file cult yes cult, yeah. yeah and and so it it it, it like I say deprogramming us slightly tongue in cheek, but also also Absolutely, genuinely. It, genuinely. It really yes. is. Yeah. It's what it is. So Yeah. All the files are all the files are a low key cult is the name of the yeah. article. Um so there's so much to um uh taking measurements that it, that the number one thing that that people don't necessarily intuitively grasp is proper mic- microphone position. I did write an article about that as well uh, on AV gadgets that you can mm. read that will walk you through how to do it, and it can make a massive difference in the. Well, in, I, I, I in, wanted in, to stress because yeah, I mean he wa- he wanted us to you know like have we come across similar stories people finding the U mic one doesn't outperform less expensive microphones like the disc mic that came with his NAD, right. and it's. This is a case, and again, I'm not saying this as a criticism of you, Bob. No. I completely understand where that coming from. But th- it is an instance here of misattribution because you're very understandably thinking to yourself, okay, I-, I left everything where it was. The only thing I changed in this scenario when I ran Dirac the first time versus running Dirac the second time, the only thing I know I changed is which microphone I used. Right. And I listened to the first run and I listened to the second run and hopefully you you use the multiple memory slots that Dirac affords you so that it wasn't literally you had to measure once, listen, measure again and go through all that time uh, and then listen again that you use the two memory slot or there's three memory slots available, but you use two out of those three memory slots and compared them that quickly back to back. And you say, I, I just subjectively, whatever it is, he's not claiming that he took a bunch of objective measurements no. and did things that way. Just I listened to it and I prefer the way the first one sounds and the, the first one was when I used the less expensive little disc mic that came with the N80 receiver. To my mind, that seems completely intuitive and logical. You know, the only thing I changed was the microphone. But you didn't. Uh, Unbeknownst to you, you had at multiple other variables at play uh, when you did those two separate sets of measurements. Not the least of which... Well, I mean, not yeah. There's there's that. Uh, you know what was used for the evaluation, but on the on the measurement taking side of things, uh, in his uh, email, he actually mentioned like he he used the stock U mic one, uh, and, and didn't do any sort of calibration to the microphone. Yeah. It's actually quite important. Uh, when you're doing the Dirac Live measurements to follow the instruction to make sure that that U-Mic 1 is pointing straight up at the ceiling and that you do load the 90-degree calibration file that 
mini DSP themselves supply with every single UMic one that gets sold. Um, you just input the serial number in mini DSP's website and they give you a calibration file for pointing the microphone at the source that you're measuring or the 90 degree calibration file for when the microphone is pointed straight up at the ceiling and you're getting the full 360 degree. And it's actually quite important that you load that 90 degree, cali degree calibration file. And he actually mentioned uncalibrated U mic one is what he used. That is not insignificant. That can make yeah. a quite significant difference to what uh, particularly in the treble happens there. But also, this is something I want to mention. Tom already touched on this. You have both of your subwoofers positioned at the front of your room. You're going to say, I have... I have two subwoofers. Like, look at them. You can see them. There are plainly two subwoofers in the image that we're showing. If you come to YouTube or you come to the Flickr album, you will see with your eyes two subwoofers. But because of where they're positioned at the front of your room, just on either side of your center speaker, acoustically speaking, that's one subwoofer. Yeah. It does not look like they are side by side because we can see a gap between the two subwoofers in that picture. There's a center speaker and an equipment stand sitting in between them. But for the wavelengths of sound that those subwoofers are producing, predominantly the base wavelengths that they're producing, those might as well be either stacked or directly side by side. Now, the good news is putting a single subwoofer in the middle of your front wall if you only had one subwoofer, that tends to be the best spot for a single subwoofer, is the very middle of your front wall. All of Todd Welty's research over at Harman indicates that if you only have one sub, putting that one sub in the middle of your front wall is almost always the best place for that one sub. And you have, in effect, done that with your two subwoofers. But... There is enough variation from just to the left of your main listening position, just to the right of your main listening position, one seat over to the left, one seat over to the right. There's enough variation there from seat to seat when you are, acoustically speaking, using a single subwoofer that you might have said, look, I followed the diagram of where Dirac said to put the microphone for the 9 or 11 or however many measurements that you took. There is very little chance <laughs> that the diaphragm of the disc microphone that you used in run number one and the U-Mic 1's diaphragm were actually in exactly the same locations for all 13 of those measurements when you did them. They might be approximately in the same location. I would expect that you approximately had them in the same location, but there can be pretty significant differences, particularly when you are, acoustically speaking, only using one subwoofer from seat to seat, from mic position to mic position, and it could easily explain how if you had used the same microphone twice and compared run one to run two you might have preferred one of them over the other uh, and that it isn't attributed to the microphone itself it's not the you mic one's fault there right. are these other variables at play so and it's that's more than that you know i mean there, uh, uh, we talk about this a lot in um when we're talking about room correction and, and those sorts of things. Again, I have so many articles on this stuff that I can't link them all up. Sure. I, I, I've linked up a bunch already, but that's not a, that's not nearly enough for everything that we're talking about But here. it should we're give you a taste and an indication yeah. and you can search for more on AV Gadgets. But there is so much, so many things that uh, affect what you hear in your mm -hmm. room. You know, we, we talked about microphone position. We talked about the, he, Rob talked about the, the calibration files. We talked about where are you sitting in the room? How have because because your proximity to that microphone makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, your room acoustics, you know, we can I can see a little bit of your room right here, and it looks like a normal room, which means right. it is devoid of room treatments. And of sure. course, <laughs> in the audio forums that you are uh, visiting, they don't you got magna pans or electrostatic speakers. You don't need room treatments because they're very directional. Eh. I, I don't necessarily <laughs> agree with that statement, but you're not just using your magna pans. You're also using everything else. And believe me, you need room treatments. Yeah. And so when we talk about DRAC in particular or uh, any room correction, uh, you need to, to get the room right before you start talking about, you know, what sounded a little bit better. Now, sure. a little bit better is... Almost always. That is I'm not a saying... whole topic unto itself of <laughs> okay. psychoacoustics, which, yeah, yeah, we don't have time to get into. We this don't have episode, time to get into sure, it, but... but I wrote an article called Everybody Who Says Their Audio Upgrade Is a Little Bit Better is a Liar. And the mm. reason I said that is because they're lying to themselves, not right. to everybody else. They end up no, lying no, to no. everybody else. But you, you want to hear something, so you hear it eventually. Audio upgrades that are upgrades, audio differences that are differences, 
aren't subtle. You hear them. Right. That's just the way it is. So um, there are so many, so many things that we can help you with here on on this, and we have started here, and we've we've kind of pointed you in the right direction, mm-hmm. but uh, and it's a lot. And that, like Rob said, it is a deep well, programming. Yeah, and I mean, that can be very uncomfortable, right? Because, you know, so far, like he said, he found us on YouTube. He's enjoyed what he's heard so far. But when we're actually talking directly to him, Uh, and it it could easily feel like an attack. Um, It is not. We do not mean it that way. If you felt attacked, please accept our apology now because that might be incoming. We we Intention matters and we do not mean it as an attack. If we sounded this way, part of it is uh, we're two hours into this podcast, so we're getting a little tired. It's 11, uh, but, 13 you know, p.m. and I've been up since 6 a.m. That's right. So and, I'm you know, some, some of this is... Um, yeah, I mean, it's that it's that we have seen this stuff before. Some of it annoys us, not not the user side of it, not your side of it, Bob, but knowing that this misinformation is out there, yeah. um, you know, and that it is so common and that it gets repeated so much and there's this echo chamber about it. So that's where, if you're sensing any frustration in our voices, that's where it's coming from. Definitely not from you. So I j- very much you're hope you are just saying what you've been taught. Just, you know, yeah, you, yeah. you have learned what people and have told you. none of it sounds unreasonable. God, it all none sounds, of it sounds unreasonable. I mean, some of it sounds a little bit unreasonable, well, let's be honest. Sure. But <laughs> you know, some of it. And every once in a while you're like, really? Gold plated sounds better than <laughs> not gold plated. Are you sure about that? Is mm. it whatever? I don't know. That doesn't seem like electrically the ele- or the speaker wire with the arrows on it. I think somebody right. asked us about audio quest at yeah. some point here. That's but later I, on. I, we're not gonna get we're to not that. gonna get to that today. I don't even think we're getting anywhere. I know that we still have like four questions. We've got left. at least four questions left. And they're long too. So if we can do one more, I'm happy. I don't know if you're Ooh, able to. because they're all long. I don't know, man. Ryan's answers are actually quite short. Let's just plow through Ryan and then that'll be it for today. Okay. Yes, no, no. We're done. <laughs> that's the preview. There we go. Ryan is on the hunt for his perfect bookshelves. Oh, that sounds easy to answer. Bookshelf speakers. The problem it's is not actually the where question. he lives, there aren't really any local stores where you can go and listen. How is one supposed to demo and compare? He has resorted to uh, ordering online, mostly from Amazon, listening at home, and then returning them. He's starting to feel really guilty. Screw Amazon. <laughs> I no know, offense. Right? That is a large company. They are definitely screwing other people. Oh, if yeah. you can take advantage of them a little bit. Hey, when I the last time I ordered climbing shoes, no, it was climbing shoes and uh, cycling helmets. I ordered so many that they <laughs> that they started charging me to return them. Yeah, and at was, some point the returns yeah. are no longer free on yeah. at Amazon. They they do have a limit. Yeah. They they will reach their limit for the. They free will returns. reach their limit. So take advantage, my my man. Sure. So should he? No, you should not. Where would uh? Where would we draw the line and say that we, he ought to start feeling bad about buying multiple pairs of speaker online, knowing full well he's only going to end up keeping one of them in the end and returning all the rest? Listen, every single one of these companies, SVS included, mm-hmm. you know, the, the other com- the other companies that do shipping both ways, they're mm-hmm. convinced, they're betting on the fact that most of the time, they are, you are going to keep their speakers most of okay. the time. Yep, sure. Most people will. Yep. So therefore, they build into the price of their speakers the fact that some people will not. Sure. And you are that person. And that is fine. And maybe you won't. Maybe you will be the person that maybe you won't send them back. Maybe you'll listen to them and go, well, you should not feel one bit, not not one bit of guilt. That's part of no. their business model. That's fine. Yes. Yep. Uh, I don't think you should feel guilty at all. I will also say if... Uh, you are in a scenario where I'm t- I'm going to talk about the vertical uh, listening window, right? If it's really just you, if you're just listening by yeah. yourself and you pretty much always sit in the same seat, so you only have to worry about where your head and ears are, uh, I'm talking on the vertical plane, uh, get some Ascend Acoustics Sierra 2 uh, EX, and I think your hunt will be done. Uh, and if you need wider vertical dispersion, uh, get the LX with the dome tweeter, and I think you'll, you'll have reached the end of your journey. And... <laughs> I think you should get the SVS Ultras. So shut up. Rob. Well, also get the SVS Ultras because those are definitely a those free return. Those are definitely return. returned one, yeah. So and, he's been a two-channel uh, music aficionado for over 10 years now. He never used to apply an EQ. He only listened in pure stereo mode. But just mm. within the past year, he has started using EQ to tailor the sound to his own personal taste. Why? Why would you wait until now? But when, is there anything wrong with applying EQ to two-channel music? What are the pros and cons of using EQ? Um, the Pros are that it sounds better to you, mm-hmm. and its cons are that the people online think that you're sure. naughty and that you deserve to be spanked. 
I mean, what I will say is, uh, and this is some reading between the lines, but it yeah. sounds as though two-channel system, maybe no subwoofers. Now, he specifically said he's looking for his quote-unquote perfect bookshelf speakers, and yeah. quite often, even amongst two-channel aficionados, if there they're are, going bookshelf speakers, they're intending to pair them with subwoofers. Yeah. But uh, there, there are some receivers where pure mode includes the subwoofer. If I remember correctly. Well, I mean, at the very least, it's going to turn off any type of... Room um, yeah, well, like base management too, though, yeah. usually, yeah. right? So, yeah, in stereo mode, you're usually going to end up with just full range going to the left and right and probably no subwoofer active. Uh, I say all of this because it relates back to question number one. Because one of the issues with trying to evaluate bookshelf speakers, or any speakers, trying to evaluate speakers when you are... Um, I mean, anytime you're playing them full range, but even like playing them without an active crossover on the bottom end of those speakers, it is super hard to accurately evaluate yeah. them because it doesn't matter if you're aware of it. Our human brains can't tune out the bass no. and yeah. they just our brains, whether we want to or not, put so much importance on the bass that we hear, that it masks a ton of other details that are going on in the higher frequencies. And it does like you can say, oh, I'm a I'm a trained listener. I've done this, I've got a ton of experience and I can I can tune in on what I want to hear. I'm here to tell you it doesn't matter how much you know about it or how much experience you have. You can't, you can't ignore what the bass does to the rest of the sound. And there can be such variance in the bass that you hear from a pair of bookshelf speakers compared to another pair of bookshelf speakers that it can wildly skew your results. So yes. this might end up that you end up rebuying some of the speakers you already tried in yep. return. Right. But them again. my my strong advice whenever, I, whenever I'm evaluating speakers is I give them like a 200 hertz crossover. I try to get rid of a lot of the low bass because I want to hear what's actually going on in the part of the frequency range that isn't going to be handled by my well set up dual subwoofers because I am always going to have a pair of well set up dual subwoofers handling the bass in my system and I want to compare what's going on in that mid-range and treble without having my perception skewed by the differences in bass between the speakers that I'm trying to compare so that might throw things out of whack but I am all in favor of using bass management and equalization because I want to get the signal there basically your room your setup your position your relative position uh, your room treatments all that stuff you can think of them as filters they are filters that are affecting the sound that you heard right the signal the electronic signal eventually reach something that turned that electronic signal into physical movement. And from there, as soon as that physical movement left the drivers of your speakers, there's a bunch of other filters that got applied to that signal. EQ is counteracting those physical filters. And therefore, I think we want to use it. We should, we should want to get back to the original signal. Yeah. I, I mean, it, by EQ, I mean, I, I think he's manually EQing these things is what it sounds like but sure I am a hundred percent for you know using your receivers or whatever you have room correction if you have yep. it if sure. you don't have it well then you know playing around with the EQ is a you know it, it it's it's but I mean, it can be very effective because very often in a dedicated two-channel setup, it yeah. is the single listener, right? It's the one seat at the optimal apex of the triangle, equidistant from the front left and right speakers. Turns out in that spot with the where the speakers are in the room and where the chair is relative to the speakers, there's this big old hump at 65 hertz or whatever it is, right? You can effectively EQ that for that one seat. I wonder you if can he's go using ahead and like do that. tone controls, if that's what he means by EQ. No, EQ. I mean, you know, I mean, a lot yeah. of AV receivers, the Denons have a graphic EQ, a manual they graphic do, EQ. The Yamahas, the Yamahas have a parametric, uh, um, you know, a, a manual parametric EQ. So, yeah, there's, there's lots of ways that you can do that manually. So, I don't know how you're doing it. So, I guess that's sure. what it comes down to. If you're, if you're just in a, a two-channel stereo room mm -hmm. then that's all it is then you may not have access to room correction i would Possibly. always use base management i would always use room yes. correction yep always there's just yep. no there's you know you want it to sound <clears throat> as good as possible and that's what does it uh lastly on a completely different topic he has a ps5 and he plays it on his alienware computer monitor 
since it's a computer monitor, it automatically shuts off the screen when the PS5 powers down and it automatically wakes back up when the PS5 is powered on, just like it would with the computer. Mm-hmm. Does that do anything to shorten the lifespan of your monitor? Would it would fully powering it down via its power switch, like you would do with a TV, be better for the lifespan of this monitor in any way? No. Nope. I mean, not as far as I'm aware. Uh, yeah, the computer monitors are definitely meant to, you know, physically they are plugged in. The power switch is on at all times. But then the the backlight, if it's an LCD one, it completely shuts off. It goes into a low power, you know, basically sleep mode when you uh, turn off when it, in response to the signal going away and then and wakes right back up when the computer comes on. Uh, that That's usually the recommended way to use them. The, the right in the manual, it will suggest that that is the best way to use the monitors. So as far as I'm aware, you're, you're aware you're absolutely not doing any damage to the lifespan uh, by using it the way it's intended to be used. All right, who we got left? We have on the list Kiran in India. Uh, David wrote into us, and Adriano, who's in Australia. So they will be the first three question askers next week. All right, I'm gonna thank our listeners of the week to get your. Uh to be listening to the week, just support the podcast in some way. We <laughs> want to thank our 131 patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast, uh, including Bertrand. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much to our 131 patrons. Bertrand, thank you for being one of them. And we want to thank those who let us know that the podcast was <laughs> er, uploaded or in With an fragmented error. form yes. from Vince, Jonathan, Mark, Herb, Martin, Theo, Valdez, and Ilango. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll just say thank you to everyone. I might have even missed a name or two. It's entirely possible. Thank you for the heads up and those TPS reports will have the correct cover letters from now on. That's right. And we, yeah. we got some notes of gratitude from Infinite Gary, Bobby, Bertrand, Vince, Mark, Bob, and Nathan. Thank you for thanking us. And I will say those names one more time because I always do. Infinite Gary, Bobby, Bertrand, Vince, Mark, Bob, and Nathan. Thank you very much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. We super duper appreciate it. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. Ah, and you want to get your question answered? All you have to do is ask yes by emailing us a question at avrant.com for av rant i'm tom Mantry. and i'm rob h now go out and listen to something once your question answered send it to question at avrant.com is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.